Okay, agenda item one, um, there was a memo um, rather than a staff report. The staff has been unable to make the needed changes, do the needed research, and present the requested maps or create the requested maps, zoning maps that were discussed. Um, this item has been continued so many times. Um, I still want to be ambitious and have it on the next agenda, but um, with the past and how many continuances, I do recommend that this item be continued to a date uncertain. Uh, right now, the cannabis program, EIR, is taking precedence over anything else, and um, we will continue to try to get this ordinance uh, in front of you. We do think it's almost complete, uh, but still, um, we're just so very limited on staffing resources. We have not been able to get to this. I have not been able to get to this. So you're asking us just to continue it and not to a specific meeting? All right. No, and there, and there was one comment received, which was attached to the memo. All right. Well, because this item is on the agenda, we will open public comment on agenda item number one. Would anybody care to address this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission. Move to continue day uncertain. We have a motion. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Any motions? I would like to um, just say that it's ex this is something that um, it's really frustrating that it is. Um, and I, it's not a criticism because I understand completely the problems that you're having and the overwhelming job that you're trying to do. I do understand that, but it's extremely frustrating that it keeps getting put off. This is something that, that is very important for many members of the community, not just the people that are cannabis growers or manufacturers or whatever. It, it's, it's important to members of the community who don't necessarily want to have to go to Shasta Lake or Redding or Humboldt County to get whatever they need or want, whether it's for medication or recreation, it makes no difference. They should, they should have access to it here. Uh, one solution we are looking at is contracting with a um, planner who has written several um, ordinances also to help with the storefront and to also help with the amendment updates um, and add capacity through that venue. So we are trying to look at solutions and I, I share your frustration absolutely and do not take that personally. Sure. Totally understand. And, and I, that sounds like a, a, a good plan. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if, if it works. Um. Thank you. Discussion. We have a motion and a second. Um, everybody's here, so I don't think we need to do roll call for this one, do we? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number two conditional use permit for Tule Creek Cannabis Project. This item for it uh, also. I'm already tired of speaking. <laughs> well, uh, I do. Uh, we do have the applicant um, present and the representative. So I will give a brief staff report and um, uh, then hand it over to um, Bilderberg staff to um, fill in any gaps that are missed. This is a request for a use permit uh, for several um, cannabis commercial related uses, the operation would include commercial cannabis cultivation, distribu distribution, I think they might have fixed it too well, distribution, commercial nursery, a type 6 non-volatile manufacturing operation, and a caretaker's unit uh, up to a thousand square feet. Um, actually, there is already a caretaker's unit on site, however, it does not be code and it will be demolished and replaced with a much improved unit and that does need to be part of the, the use permit. The project area includes those areas used for cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, nursery, processing, including gardens, soil staging areas, 
proposed harvest activity areas, material storage areas, ancillary buildings, irrigation systems, employee areas, and access roads. Definitely a lot going on with this project. Um, the proposed project is located in the historical mill and gold dredging site on 553.9 acres, previously disturbed ground in Hayfork. The project applicant proposes an operation of cannabis, commercial cannabis cultivation as a small cultivation site, allowing up to 10,000 square feet of canopy with future expansion of up to one acre of canopy as future Trinity County regulations allow. The proposed project is located at 690 Tule Creek Road in Hayfork. And the general plan designation is industrial. Existing zoning is heavy industrial manufacturing, which is defined as an M2 zone under the Hayfork community plan. Existing land use is a former wood mill and gold mining site. There's been uh, quite a bit of disturbance on this site. It, over the years, historically. Adjacent land use information, um, basically it's undeveloped land, agricultural reserve, and rural residential land uses around this parcel. Um, now, as far as the table below on your staff report right at the bottom of page one, um, you'll see uh, it says location north in that first row, undeveloped forest. Um, that's incorrect. I think um, our consultant did SHN prepared this, and if you do look at the satellite view, there is an area of wetland and some trees um, north of the middle building. It's still on the parcel. If one doesn't know better, you might think it's forest. It's not. Um, the north adjacent land use is agricultural and uh, with a flood zone and floodway. So if that looks a little weird, it is, and it's probably not correct. Um, there in the staff report, um, quite an extens extensive narrative of the various uses. Um, I will um, not go into great detail. I gave, as I said, a brief overview of the proposed uses and uh, let the Bilderberg staff um, answer any questions and clarify those uses in more detail. No comments have been received from the public regarding this project. Uh, the proposed CEQA determination is a mitigated negative declaration, and um, the staff, re staff recommendation and findings is that the proposed project and evaluation of the surrounding land uses and existing zoning designation is the planning staff's opinion that the continued and expanded cannabis cultivation and distribution activities at the site are compatible with the general plan and neighborhood designation, zoning designations historical uses of the properties, and the expected intensities of anticipated future uses. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution and findings of the initial study and mitigated negative declaration are consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA requirements and adopt a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, an MMRP, that provides sufficient mitigation to reduce impacts from the project to a less than significant level. Also, approve conditional use permit for the development of cannabis cultivation facilities subject to the conditions of approval attached to your resolution for that use as provided in the staff report and of the county's applicable commercial cannabis ordinances. And at that point, I will conclude my presentation. And answer any questions you have of me. Questions uh, Mr. Chair, a couple points. One, uh, directing you pointed out that table where it says it's up in old forest when you mentioned wetland. If you look at any of the pictures where the FEMA floodplain is turned off, the adjacent properties are not wet. They're developed properties. There's a, the other side of the road. It appears that the parcel abuts to the Creek Road and across the road are developed parcels. Yes. Say, to the north, we have development. Uh, not on 
developed anything or floodplain. It isn't a floodplain, but it is developed. Correct, and it is not agricultural, and it is developed. And yes, absolutely. The wooded area is on the project site parcel. I think it's zoned as rural. But it's willows and stuff. It's zoned rural residential. So it's a rural residential area to the north. Of the I checked the zoning before I came over, and it was agricultural. Okay, so you may get a chance to check again. Okay, <laughs> I will. Uh, my second question has to do with this. Uh, Infamous zone M2. Um, there is no zone M2 in the zoning ordinance. It does appear in the, as you point out, in the specific plan from K4 from 1996 as a specific plan designation. And it is in the zoning map that was included in that. And this plan was adopted by the board in 1996. But the statutory requirement then to make the general plan and the zoning ordinance consistent with this never happened, and there is no zone M2. So it's always been a curious thing to us as to how M2 ended up in the GIS system or not applied to any of these parcels. And in fact, I was reminded earlier today that we had another application on this very same parcel, this very same issue came up at that time. Apparently, I thought at the time there may have been a rezone part of that application to rezone it to I. Was, was that a map, a proposed map? No, it was exactly the same. It was a oh, type of application, a project of campus manufacturing and mm -hmm. a similar set of requirements, uh, excuse me, a similar set of license applications. Mm -hmm. But there is no M2. Um, now it is curious, and I think I brought this up when we did the nursery that it mentions M2, which doesn't exist in the zoning order. But I would also point out that this applicant is asking for distribution and um, manufacturing. Now, unlike cultivation, where we list the places you cannot cultivate, in those ordinances, we specifically list the zones where you may get a license, and M2 does not appear there. So if it is a zone, then you can't get distribution or manufacturing. And it's not a zone, you know, because it's not in the Title 17, then the whole thing is questionable. I, I think the easy way out would be to continue this and bring it back with a rezone and rezone this parcel to industrial and then all the issues drop out. That, that's an observation at this point. I'm just asking questions. Of, do you have any other questions of staff before we continue on? I, I don't have any questions, but I, I do. Um, we, you may have overheard me saying a little bit ago that, that in the Hayfork Community Plan, the Hayfork Community Plan does refer to M as a zone. Um, the Hayfork Community Plan was worked on and completed in terms of the work that the people who were doing it in Hayfork were, were going to do, but it never was, was completely finished and submitted to the planning department and, and to, the board, to, to the planning commission and the board of supervisors. And in that, it had changed all of those M's to I for consistency. And I don't know if that makes any difference because it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a, you know, it's it's not been turned in and, and certified and voted on and everything else. But, but um, and I don't remember last time that we did recommend it being rezoned. Um, I think we just left it that it was going to be. That, that M and I were the same, and that because we, we approved the CUP at that at that meeting, and so we must not have requested that there be a reason. We could go back and look at those minutes too. Um, about how many minutes we have that? Two, three? Uh, two. I think it was two. I don't think it was three. It was two years. Okay. Any 
any other questions of staff before we open this to public comment? Well, we will start out with the applicant or, I guess, Bilderberg, you know, give the agent Bilderberg, would you guys care to have the first public comment or? I'm Rachel with Bilderberg. We've been in development with this project since March 2019 on existing industrial grounds in Cape Work. It's previously disturbed by agriculture, then a doodle bug dredge, and then finally the mill site. This would take the existing infrastructure of the mill site and rehabilitate it into cannabis facilities and provide expansion of the existing facilities, provide jobs, and provide a central network for cannabis cultivators to distribute their product in Trinity County. Uh, the CUP proposes up to 34 employees, which many people are really excited about, especially in Cape Um There's been a touch of discussion on the wetland. So the wetland is the old mill pond. There's an existing farm around it. And since it has been neglected, it's turned into a moderately mature wetland. There's no plans to move or touch or rehabilitate or do anything with this wetland. It's actually a great screening feature between Tule Creek Road and the project site. Um, there's additional screening from Salt Creek and Tule Creek with nice vegetation, so there's a lot of aesthetic buffer with the wetland and the creeks. The flood zone around the creeks, obviously they have to stay out of it, and it's been um, recorded by FEMA, so it's relatively easy to do so. Um, we're really excited about this project, and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions right off for the representative? Uh, my name is Scott Watkins. I'm the principal of Bilderberg. I just want to jump in on Commissioner McHugh's uh, comment about industrial um, the zoning on page five of the initial study does claim zoning is industrial. So um, maybe that resolves uh, that issue. Well, with all due respect, the CEQA is the overriding document on what the actual zoning is. That's true. Uh, I don't know if maybe the staff report had a clerical error, um, but the project was proposed as industrial zoning. I thought the staff would tell me. Um, all right. We will open this up to public comment. Anybody care to comment on this item? Hi, good evening, Commissioner. It's Tom Belenko, Douglas City. Um, I was wondering if I could get the phone number of the four trimmers that can handle one acre of canopy cultivation. <laughs> Other than that, I think uh, this is a project that should move forward. Um, I do notice that the uh, the staff report that accompanied the, I think it's a neighboring parcel uh, from Somi Hoffman. On page one of that staff report, uh, there's a footnote that says that the January 25th 2018 Planning Commission meeting, commissioners clarified that the M2 designation is synonymous with the industrial zoning district. The Hayport Community Plan included maps of recommended M2 parcels, but did not include the description of the M2 zoning district. Reference to M2 in the staff report includes industrial zoning as the county's GIS database does not currently reflect this change. Uh, I don't know if that really helps clear the waters or maybe muddy them further, but it does demonstrate that we have been in this place before, and I think that C I know that CUP moved forward. Um, it may be something we want to look at, maybe on, on I, I believe these are the only two M2 designations we have, or maybe the other mill site we pay for. But that may be something separate. I, I, I hope that doesn't uh, stop the commission from dealing with this issue. Uh, and I do I think you should pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Any 
for the public comment. So I'm Tom Evans, one of the property owners, along with Doug Evans, who's also here tonight. And uh, I just wanted to, I'll be real brief, but for us, we're really excited about this project for the economic development benefit it proposes for the community of Haythorpe. We're both locals, we grew up there. For me personally, I spent two years working for the Watershed Research and Training Center in Haythorpe, trying to launch a project on this property to create a, basically a hodgepodge of wood products businesses to create sustainable economic and sustainable jobs in the community. And, you know, Trinity County is tough when it comes to businesses. And uh, we're isolated and, what, 79% of the county is, is publicly owned. And so um, with those headwinds, the previous endeavor that the nonprofit tried to do was not successful. But we truly feel that the project that we are presenting tonight is in solid footing and really has the potential to do well and create jobs on this site that has been underutilized for decades in the community. And for us, it's really exciting to, to be able to see that move forward. And, uh, you know, cannabis is already very much embedded, especially in the community of Hayport, and it's already overcoming the economic headwinds that so many other businesses struggle with here in Trinity County. And we feel that it's a good fit for the parcel and for the community. Thank you. Robert from Junction City, and uh, <clears throat> this project should be a slam dunk. Uh, I'd like to see uh, unanimous votes for approval on this uh, tonight. I see no reason to continue it, and uh, it's exactly what the community needs. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more public commenters, we'll bring us back to the commission. Go ahead and make a motion, um, and then we can discuss it. And I move that we adopt the resolution and findings that the initial study and mitigated negative declaration are consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA requirements and adopt the Mitigated Monitoring and Reporting Program, MMRP, that provides sufficient mitigations to reduce impacts from the project to a less than significant level. Approve the conditional use permit for development of a cannabis cultivation facility subject to the conditions of approval for that use as provided in this staff report and of the county's applicable commercial cannabis ordinances. Do we have a motion? Would anyone care to second that motion? I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Uh, further comment? I will make a motion that we continue the item to the next meeting specifically and ask staff to come back with a clarification on the zoning question. We have a competing motion. Anyone care to second that motion? I will second that motion myself. Now we have two motions and two seconds. Um, Discussion. Is the county Council available to provide guidance to the commission on this matter? I don't believe so. No. Given the fact that when um, this same parcel with very, very similar um, plans by, by Somi Hoffman. Um, was approved without with with the notation that the M designation was synonymous synonymous with the I zoning. I don't feel that we need any further clarification, and I don't feel that we need to put the applicant through the expense and time of doing a rezone. Uh, if if this were the first time this had come up, then perhaps. But since we didn't do it before, I see no reason to do it now. 
I'm inclined to agree with that. My biggest issue is I do not remember exactly how we addressed this in the past, and I don't want to do something different. You know, it's like if we, if I could remember how we addressed that M and I in the. We, we addressed it by saying that, that they were the same and that, that and the was, intent of the Hayfork Community Plan, that the intent of the M was to be industrial. And that's exactly what what the argument was. We, we definitely need to clean up that, that mess. And, and it will be done once out. we do the community plan. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not the community plan. Well, the community plan retracts the yes. that would do it. Yes. But it's the general plan and zoning on this. We need to catch up. Something needs to get caught up. So, do we have any further discussion? Uh, yeah. Well, it seems like other than the MI um, confusion, it seems like it's a slam dunk. Without that clarity, I'm not sure. All right, well, the, uh, we have two motions on the table. We will start with the second motion by Commissioner McHugh. And I don't believe we need a real call vote on this. So, for Commissioner McHugh's motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Okay. So on, oh, okay, uh, that motion fails, three, or two to three, on Commissioner Stewart's motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 No. Opposed? No. no. Okay, motion carries three to two. Um, I do have one question. Did you put? I voted no. Uh, I do have a question. That motion is passed. We're going on forward with this project. I still would like to see some clarification at the next meeting, if we can, of what actually happened at the last time this came up. I'm not sure. Looking at the map, it almost looks like there's two parcels right there. One of them we already did this with. If it's not the exact same parcel, um, I don't. They didn't mention fireworks manufacturing, so I'm thinking it's the next door parcel. Um, it, it would be nice to know how we dealt with that, if we did anything, and how we can how we can either get rid of the M zoning or what we have to do to clean this up in the future because there is still one more mill site in Hayworth that we could end up with more stuff. Okay, so uh, to clarify what's being requested is to follow up on this item, have it on the agenda as a follow-up discussion with the background of what happened previously on the adjacent parcel, which is permitted, and, and then also some solutions to resolve this issue moving forward. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm not that concerned personally if it's an agenda item or if it's just something you bring up in your in your uh, director's report just if, if somebody could have some information just so we I, I would recommend that if we're going to live with the footnote that was read mm -hmm. that should be brought forward as a resolution we state that or, or fix the zone order oh. the other. but we, there needs to be something that codifies of this yeah. interpretation. That would be good. Okay. Um, okay. We will. I, I feel that we, this should be an item that goes on the agenda just so we can have a discussion and, and there can be contribution from the public if, so if they're aware of the item being discussed. Okay. Um, and, and make sure we look up that footnote and see what's been done in the past. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Agenda item number three. Mitigated negative deck and monitoring reporting program for the Indian Creek Connectivity and Restoration Project. Transition here. Good evening. Um, ask questions. Should I sit up front? Is that better? Where would you like me to sit? Come on. Here? Okay. Yeah. But we can hear you a little bit better if you're comfortable hanging out the mask. 
new at this. Good evening, Commissioner Chair. Uh, David Colbeck, Department of Transportation and Environmental Compliance. It's good to be back in front of you. It's been a little while now. Um, I'm here to present a project, um, but before I do that, I need to uh, get to a few, a few clerical issues. One is that, as requested, there were some larger printouts of some figures that were included in the mitigated negative declaration that I'd like to hand out. as well uh, the resolution that was provided in your staff report had a very small uh, problem with it in terms of the acreage was one acre off and so I wanted to correct that for, for your potential adoption tonight so I'd like to hand that up as well so the one in your staff report would no longer be the current So now that that is out of the way, I'm here to present to you the adoption of a significant uh, negative declaration uh, for uh, Indian Creek Connectivity and Rehabilitation Project. Uh, it is being proposed by the Yurok Tribe, and there are several staff members in the room tonight that are here to answer any questions that you may have, technical background, purpose, and need, anything along those lines, they are available. I would like to attempt to answer any questions you may have first, but if I get stuff, then they are here to, to help out. Um, the document that is before you has been put together in a partnership with the Europe Tribe uh, in BLM, representing as co-leads the NEPA process. County staff and planning department and myself have put together the CEQA component of it. Uh, it is a little bit of an unusual pr um, document because it's, it's a joint NEPA CEQA document, which I'm not sure that this commission has seen before. Uh, it's not very common, honestly. It's the direction maybe in the future of this type of environmental work, but uh, it is usually done by, say, Caltrans or Fish and Wildlife or uh, the Trinity River Restoration Program that are represented by different uh, CEQA leads. So this document is uh, NEPA CEQA. It is an environmental assessment and initial study, uh, which has then led to a mitigated negative declaration for the CEQA component. Uh, a FONSI, finding of no significant impact for the NEPA side, is expected to be signed soon by the BLM as main lead. The, the nexus, the reason that NEPA is involved here is because this project is on BLM land. There are four parcels involved, two are public, uh, public individuals, or private individuals, I'm sorry, and then, and then the BLM. So because it's on federal land and it has some federal funding, then that is the nexus for NEPA, uh, the requirement for NEPA in terms of CEQA. The need here is a floodplain development permit that has been applied for by the applicant that had some discretionary review which required CEQA uh, to be completed. In terms of the permit itself, the floodplain development permit, there is a section in county code that allows for this type of habitat or wildlife improvement project to move forward under a director's decision, a director's use permit, as long as a uh, professional engineer has created uh, some sort of documentation, stamped and certified, that it meets uh, code requirements, principally that the project does not raise, fl raise floodplain uh, elevations above one foot, which has been provided to the director. That permit is pending your decision tonight. Uh, so the project itself, the location is uh, in the Creek, as I mentioned, on the eastern side of Trinity County. It is about in the middle of the watershed. It's uh, roughly seven miles from the uh, intersection with uh, Highway 3. Uh, the figures that are provided for you, I believe, give you some, or uh, perhaps in the MND itself, give you some sense of the location of the project. Uh, the purpose of the project is uh, multifold. It's to restore fisheries, hydraulic connectivity, geomorphic processes, improve water quality, principally for sediment, uh, as well as enhance riparian vegetation. Overall, to increase the, the natural function of that specific reach of Indian Creek. Uh, in order to do that, there will be roughly 4,000 linear feet of watershed that will be involved in the project. Uh, 
Uh, it's approximately almost 40,000 cubic yards of material involved in terms of cut and fill that is all located on the site that is just being moved from one location to another in order to reach those project goals. There will be a large woody material placement that is meant to increase stream function in terms of roughness features, as well as some replanting efforts in terms of native willow that are currently going to be harvested on site. Uh, this type of project is uh, it's called Stage Zero, which is a method for restoration, and it's something that we're excited to try here in this, in this county, uh, and happy to discuss that any further if you have additional questions. In terms of what's in front of you tonight, in terms of the CEQA document, the environmental evaluation, we do the standard process. Aside from the nuances and formatting with the NEPA CEQA components, it still follows the same CEQA uh, guidelines, uh, answered relevant questions, and had the public comment period, uh, tribal consultation period. And uh, I want to stress that in terms of Adopting this type of CEQA document, it's a required that, that you as the deciding body review the comments that were received and to uh, understand the, the responses. So I just wanted to point that out as it was mentioned in the staff report itself. I provided in the staff report a brief synopsis of those comments uh, that were received, which are also included in Appendix F of the Mitigated Negative Declaration document. I'm going to refrain from reading straight through those, but I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, I also here have some copies that they need to review that again, as well as the Mitigated Monitoring Reporting Program, uh, which is also a component of the adoption of, of, this, uh, of this document. Um, so I want to keep it brief. I think I did the best I could. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. of this magnitude has been attempted in this site? I did include that in the staff report, some history of this particular location. Yes, there have some been, there have been some attempts to improve this particular region. It's been heavily impacted by mining principally, uh, as well as some timber impacts or logging impacts. Uh, the creek itself, the current condition, is, is uh, pretty incised. It's pretty impacted. Uh, it has lost its ability, basically, to, to function naturally within the width of its own floodplain. So yes, there were attempts in 1997. Uh, there was another attempt in 2011, and those attempts were not successful. Uh, this particular project is a different design approach. Uh, I wouldn't call it aggressive, but it's more holistic in its, its approach and with the goal of allowing the creek to, nat to function naturally as the principal component of what they're trying to do. Uh, it, it's a more expansive project than what was attempted earlier, and so there's high hopes for success. Commissioner Tom Belanco, Douglas City, uh, Indian Creek Road in Douglas City, to be more specific. Um, I've been paying attention to this project for years now. Uh, it's an intriguing concept that they're proposing. I, uh, I think, based on some of the other uh, approaches that have been tried, I think this one actually has a, a chance of restoring connectivity in the creek, which would be a great thing, uh, both you know, for my personal belief in, in having a creek that's uh, connected both to the Trinity River and the ocean, but also for habitat and habitat potential. It's uh, an anadromous creek, and if there's connectivity, uh, there's not now. I just drove by it a few minutes ago. Um, but if, if we could restore that, which has been missing for decades, uh, it improves one of the, one of the last uh, upper reaches that's not damped. It's, uh, I don't know how many streams are, there are beyond Indian Creek before we get to the Lewiston Dam, but the Indian Creek is certainly one of them, and it's a long journey from the ocean to there, but it would be great if we had that connectivity restored. Um, if you 
go through these documents, I think they, they are more than comprehensive about what's being proposed and, and uh, how it can have a potential benefit uh, to the environment there. So I think uh, I'd encourage us to approve and uh, I, I hope that NEPA and the federal agency uh, sees fit to approve this as well and then we can get started. I see the wood staged out there already. So this is a project I think is really ready to go, probably just waiting uh, for these two approvals. So I hope uh, they get this one tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? General Bauer from Junction City. Uh, I, I agree with the previous speaker. Um, this is exactly the sort of project we need to see. And, and try. Uh, you know, we're watching the salmon salmonids go extinct every year. It's a little worse, a little worse, a little worse. This is exactly the place we should be spending money and effort and trying what we can while we still got a few fish. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll bring this back to the commission. Commissioners. question um, for staff or this stage zero concept of um, rehabilitation has that been attempted elsewhere in the Klamath Basin uh, it has not been attempted in the Klamath Basin specifically it, it has been attempted in a number of other areas in the Pacific Northwest and internationally uh, so it, it's no so basically for this region that's one of the reasons that this project is exciting to staff and the applicant of course uh, is because it's, it's a chance to see how it can affect this particular reach. There are a number of similar reaches within the Klamath Basin and the Trinity Basin specifically that could also benefit from, benefit from this type of approach that is taking a relatively low gradient wide floodplain that has been impacted, that is basically mostly cobbled and goes subsurface. There's a number of reaches, other creeks that, that this could potentially be applied to. Uh, but to answer your question, no, not in the Klamath specifically. Yeah, it's really encouraging, and, and uh, I'm, it's yeah, it's something that many of our watersheds need rehabilitation. Um, that being said, um, where was the nearest where's the nearest zone stage zero rehabilitation that has occurred? I will call on uh, staff Hi. member Kyle to help me with that. Kyle Vanderlo is with the Yurok tribe. Hello, Commissioners. Good evening. Um, stage zero it has been implemented at many sites in Oregon. Some of them are in southern central Oregon on the coast. Um, others are in the McKenzie drainage in the Willamette. Um, the, the Willamette Forest uh, has a biologist there, um, Paul Powers, who's done a lot of these projects, not only on their forest, but neighboring forests. And so I would say that's kind of the hub but it's been done on the dry um, eastern side of Washington and Oregon, as well as the coastal range, and they've seen great success and immediate response from fish. Thank you. If it's of any interest to the commissioners, I did put together some additional examples of stage zero construction. It's a very simplified figure format of just, just pictures of a project that, that uh, Kyle just mentioned uh, in the McKenzie River drainage in Deer Creek up in Oregon. Uh, if that's of interest, I put that together for your review just related to state, the application of stage zero techniques. Yes. yes. Okay. Well. Further discussion, motion. To highlight in that on the first page is Indian Creek itself, a photo taken in mid-July mid of this year showing the condition of the creek uh, subsurface flows, which is again a, a component of this project, a goal to increase hydrologic connectivity.
this in the secret document, right? Is the this is the work you're going to do going to disturb any uh, bad residual effects of mining, either mercury or I've forgotten what the sequence is. So what is it? can you remind? That is fair. Fair question. So we received one of the comments that we received. There were three agencies that responded, and four private individuals. One of those comments uh, to the MND, as it was out in public comment period, was from the topic Department of Toxic Substance and Control. I'm sorry, I didn't say that correctly, but it is actually located in Appendix F of the MND. Uh, one of their questions was related to hazardous materials, and as they relate to to mining. Uh, our answer is, uh, our response to that comment was that uh, no, that further investigation is not needed in order to uh, describe any sort of potential methylated mercury or biologically available mercury concerns. Because the, where that mining occurred in the past was principally in the terraces above the project area itself. So if you imagine the valley floor where the work is principally happening, the mining occurred on terraces up or at a higher elevation from that. So some mining alluvium has, over the last hundred years or so, found its way into the project area. But what we're stating is that because over the last 80, 100 years, that bed load has been sifted and sorted so often in such flood events as occurred in 97, which destroyed sort of previous restoration effort. That bed load has been sorted to the point where the mercury in the top levels is not likely to be of concern. More than that, it, it doesn't have the conditions in those areas of grading where the methylation of mercury can occur in terms of anoxic soils or an anoxic conditions or organic or sulfuric soil, soil layers that allow the bacteria to survive that actually creates met or methylates the mercury. So our, our understanding is that the, the confines of the project and where the grading occurs, which again is in one of your larger printouts, uh, the yellow, red, green, which is also in the MND for the sort of public, uh, shows that area of cut and fill with respective depths. So you can see that for much of the cut area, it's really not very deep. It doesn't get to a depth that was identified in the investigatory pits that were dug in that area, about nine of them were part of the investigation for this project, uh, did not get to the depth where there could be a potential for anoxic conditions. Uh, there's also the idea of a continual uh, wetting and drying can help create some methylating conditions, but this project is meant to increase the groundwater level to a point where riparian vegetation can take hold. At the moment, the depth is pretty significant, where, and that's the reason that those pictures, or the, the current condition of the site is so abused, is because the groundwater is so low that nothing can grow. So as you inundate or raise that groundwater table to allow for repairing vegetation, you also further you reduce the ability for uh, mercury to be methylated. And, and that, again, is in the response. So the staff report um, uh, communicated information about noxious weeds, but help clarify, I live in Junction City, and when the fire came through, and it was recolonized primarily with invasive Broom, tree of heaven or paradise, um, star thistle, um, ivy, Himalaya berries. It seems like it was the noxious weeds that recolonized when the area was disturbed. And so 
what type of mitigations is this project going to undertake to re <laughs> That, that doesn't occur here. Uh, that, is a, that is a fair point. Uh, Any time ground is disturbed, then you have the potential to reactivate an existing seed bank of invasive or noxious weeds that may already be present. Uh, unfortunately, the methods to deal with that are, can be uh, somewhat limited uh, in their ability because this project, is a, well, this project is applying what you really generally think of standard best management practices. Uh, that includes one comment that was received from an individual uh, where the equipment is to be washed thoroughly before it even enters uh, the watershed. That, again, is something that's relatively common, but is something that will be focused on in terms of the environmental commitments for, for this project. Uh, there are no soils that will be imported for this project. It is uh, only using what is existing on site. Uh, some, some of you jump. <laughs> the, um, the plan for revegetation is principally limited to uh, what native vegetation already occurs in terms of willow plantings. So harvesting willow, not all of it, but basically you take cuttings of a, a bunch of willows. You take some of those and you install them into other places. So one of the best ways to combat uh, noxious or invasive weeds is, is to utilize the native vegetation that is on site uh, seeding and native grass seeding as well will help compete and help reduce the likelihood. Uh, there are some monitoring components that are, that are related to the post project. Those are principally related to other, other factors. But you're, you're right to bring it up, but I want to highlight that uh, for this type of project, it is doing what it can reasonably do in order to prevent that from happening. Great, right, thank you. Not a great deal, that's true, and that's part of, again, the project rule. Uh, there are some trees on site that will be harvested, but there's another uh, figure in the MND, and I apologize, I can't point to it specifically at the moment, but it shows areas of where uh, vegetation will essentially be left, and other groups that, that yeah, can be harvested as part of the grading operation. That would include any sort of larger bed load as well for roughness features, that is a, a goal of the project. Uh, there are, as a uh, commenter stated earlier, there are some trees that are uh, slated to be used for this project. They are full length with bowl attached type trees, which are ideal for any uh, creek watershed restoration type pra uh, practice. Those came from uh, an associated project on BLM land in the same watershed, in the Indian Creek watershed, that was under a timber harvest plan. And that would be uh, something to discuss with the Yurok's in terms of Yurok tribe staff members about uh, any more details about those trees themselves, but they, they did come from the watershed and they are uh, ready to be installed. Great. I move that we adopt the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA determination of a mitigated negative declaration and the mitigated monitoring and reporting program and adopt the recommended findings listed in resolution PC-2020-08. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any competing motions for the discussion? We should clarify we're talking about I apologize for that confusion in the forms. I just wanted that to be as accurate as possible. There was a simple mistake in terms of the number that I used. You're looking for the one in the whereas, the first whereas. 21.4. 21.4 acres okay. is the new one. 
and that is the one that is uh, the current final uh, suggestion for adoption. Then, if I can amend my motion um, to adopt the recommended findings listed in the amended resolution PC-2020-8 that lists 21.4 acres of uh, floodplain on four privately and publicly owned parcels. And I'll second that too. Right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Competing motions? All right, this is a resolution, so this will be a roll call vote. Commissioner McHugh. Aye. Commissioner Matthews. Aye. Commissioner Stewart. Aye. Commissioner McIntosh. Aye. Chair Frazier. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. We will move on to. Agenda item number four. Before we get started, though, would anybody, anybody need to take a recess for a motion? Okay, yes, yeah, we will take a recess for a motion. Okay, we will reconvene the August 13th oh, yeah. regular meeting of the Trinity County Planning Commission. Um, we are moving on to agenda item number four, zoning text amendment to amend Trinity County Code Chapter 17.17 Duplex for Residential R2 District. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, and members of Public. My name is Lisa Lozier. I will be presenting agenda item number R4. Um, this is a text amendment and this project was initiated um, by county staff and um, it, it specifically deals with chapter 1717 um, duplex residential or the R2 district and um, what we're going to talk about tonight is very specifically section 1717.010 which um, is currently codified as a reserve section, and uh, section 1717.020, which is uses permitted subject to first securing a use permit in each case. So um, to back up a little bit, uh, July 23rd, uh, 2020, at the last Planning Commission, staff brought forward a resolution to the Planning Commission and requested direction in regard to the 1717.010, which is the reserve section, which typically would include uses permitted by right. So in this case, currently, there are no uses permitted by right in the duplex residential R2 district. So the commission um, adopted the resolution and directed staff to come back with some suggestions as to what that might look like for permitted uses in this district. So this is the uh, topic that we're going to discuss this evening. So um, ultimately in, uh, in 2014, uh, the Planning Commission and the uh, Board of Supervisors were going through and looking at the requirements of the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act and the California Fair Employment and Housing Act. And there were a number of changes to the zoning ordinance at that point in time. And the changes to section 1717 were made also at that time. So um, personally, looking through the information, I believe that um, there was probably some make mistakes made as far as what the strikeout was and what the intent was. Um, that's just my opinion. You know, ultimately, I wasn't there. I'm sure there's some members of the commission that have a, a much more information regarding that than I do. So 
um, ultimately what we're going to do this evening is, is take a look at, at what staff has recommended and uh, hopefully have some discussion and we'll go from there. So proposed, what, what staff is proposing um, on uh, for section 1717010 as permitted uses, um, we would strike the, the word reserved add uses permitted, and we would add two single family structures as permitted uses, duplexes, and also triplex as a single structure. That, that would be the recommendation for 1717-010. Uh, and um, on to amend section 17.17020, um, and that is uses permitted subject to first securing a use permit in each case. On number A, we would propose to strike where it says two single family structures. We would also propose to strike where it says uh, triplex single structure. And, and that would be the total of, of uh, staff's recommendation. Any questions to staff? I, I have a, a question. <clears throat> if condominiums are included in A, what about apartment buildings? Or con, because it's, I was trying to argue with myself that, well, maybe an argument, or an apartment building is so similar to a condominium that they're the same, but they aren't. <laughs> The difference, the difference being condominiums are owned, the units right, exactly. are owned versus apartment complex. Yeah, exactly. Um, we did try to keep, um, based on the, um, um, based on the discussion uh, regarding the initiation of this rezone and, and um, their approval to proceed from the Planning Commission, we tried to keep these changes very minor in nature, uh, almost surgical. And uh, there, when we do um, start working on some zoning amendments that is coming up, it is part of the general plan RFP uh, request for proposals and some targeted zoning amendments, especially those related to housing uh, compliance with state housing law. There'll be further changes. Um, so this is the just immediate have some uses permitted as appropriate, and then we'll go back later and we'll be looking at all of our residential zones for compliance with state law. Okay, so so can you make a note to to um, bring up the possibility of adding apartments to that? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, that would seem like that would be R three. We do have an R three zone where multifamily, multifamily. This is this is. No, no, I, I am aware of that. But with the CUP, uh, there may be a small apartment building that would be appropriate. Um, but, but if we're not going to do it now, no, then, then no. we don't even need to discuss it. Right. Uh, right now, my recommendation is take condominiums out, and this is an, a, a, a medium density zone, and yes. any apartments or condos go in the higher density zone. And, and that, that makes perfectly sense. I just think if condos there, it either shouldn't be, or, a, or apartment should well, be. We out. could definitely strike it tonight. Mm -hmm. and Okay, I'm Okay, maybe we can't definitely do that, but it could be considered in okay. this um, amendment. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, do we have any other questions for staff? I, I have one. Okay. In the spirit of making minimal changes, which I thoroughly concur with, since you're trying to avoid triggering sequel here, um, since you can have two single-family dwellings, it strikes me that, uh, that you don't allow one single-family dwelling without a condition use permit. Now, I understand it's R2 and not R1, but I can have two single-family structures by right, but I can't put one in there and maybe do one later, or, you know, this all came from the mother-in-law federal housing thing, and uh, it strikes me out that you're making, because the, the, Original um, chapter 1717 that was amended by that exercise uh, turned 
uh, two single family, I don't think it said two single family structures. I think we added that. It didn't make it but um, so if you're going to say two single family structures versus a single family dwelling, that would really strike me as a um, The other point of that comment, and we can come back, we don't need to get into discussion on it's just an observation. You did insert triplex, and I think I mentioned this last time. So if you put three families on that parcel, now you may be waiting in the sequel territory because you're changing what the intent of the original ordinance that got amended by the federal housing rule and the state housing rule um, by going from allowing a second family or a duplex anywhere, which is what they wanted, to now putting three on that parcel. Mm -hmm. um, without, so you're not doing a sequel here, you're giving that right away here, and you're taking it out of conditional use permit, so you're not going to do sequel there either. So all of a sudden, all the duplexes become triplexes with no sequel analysis. Yes, an ADU would still be allowed with the two single family residences. A what would be? An a ADU. ADU. An accessory dwelling unit. Uh, I'm sorry, accessory dwelling unit. I can't, I saw it in there somewhere. Where, um, it seems to me like what Commissioner McHugh was asking is why can't you have one? Um, if you are if you're zoned R two, you can't. If the way this is written, you do not have the right to build one house. That's right. No, I understand that. You would have to build two, and uh, and that's that's the purpose of R two is you start to get higher density, um, and and so it's if someone can, they're going to buy it and they're going to put a single family house, it's in, and that will happen more often than not. And the purpose is to have housing options and affordable housing options, which usually are multiple. You know, are multi-family units, um, not always, but in a general rule, we look at multi-family units as affordable. So as we're looking at housing options, if there is an option to just put one single family residence on a parcel, then you're taking this medium density, we're gonna call it medium density because it's not your single family, it's a duplex or triplex uh, possibly with ADUs, and you're, you're not full apartment complex, you're not full condos, it's that medium density and that fills a gap in the need for housing. Uh, and that was the mindset. Great. Right. Makes perfect sense. Any other questions? All right, we will open agenda item number four to public comment. Anyone care to comment? Good evening, my name is Dana Ryan and I live in Weaverville. And I may have um, been the one that uh, brought this to the attention of um, having just a special use permit for R2 lots. I own three R2 lots, and there's others that are in the community. I sold one of my R2 lots a couple years ago to a developer, a contractor actually, and um, it was involved enough to where he was busy doing just single family dwellings that he didn't want to take the time to go through the special use permit. Um, and so I just, I, I may have brought it to the attention that I'd like to build something on these R2 lots but to, to go through uh, the use permit process without having the right to um, have a special direction of what you can put on an on a R2 or R1 or an R3 lot. Um, I, I'm the one that I think has brought it to the attention and I think that it should be brought back uh, to where it was. It was, I think, accidentally omitted. And you can't just, uh, I guess what I'm saying is when I bought the R2 lots, I was expecting to be able to go in and build a duplex right away without having some complications. And being busy doing other projects, it's easier just to set those aside. I think on the, with the R2, um, you were, one of you were asking why you can't put a single home on there. I would like that as well. But the whole purpose of it is to have more density. Um, R3, uh, Obviously, you can put a lot more, but uh, they don't like to downsize it. If it's R2, they don't want you to put a single family home. They want you to have more houses on it, more living space. So thank you for taking your consideration on doing this. Thank you. Any further public comment? With that, we will bring it back to the commission. I'm not convinced of the triplex 
So for clarification, are you saying that you would prefer to wait to say to um, say just let me get this right here. Wait to say um, two single family structures and duplexes are uses permitted and put putting triplex under with a sink with a CUP or that's some you would like to wait to do. I would like to see the triplex in. I believe this is more of a medium density zone and a triplex would fit nicely into that. But um, it is um, at the will of the Planning Commission and uh, I do, um, you know, uh, Commissioner McHugh makes a very good point. And the goal was to keep this simple and surgical. So uh, I would prefer to see triplexes personally because it offers another housing option in that me medium density. And that's why we tried it. But if it doesn't work this round, we'll hopefully get to that later. I don't have the general plan in front of me, but could you give um, just like a brief description of um, high density versus medium density? I'm not even sure the general plan defines that, to be honest. Of update though, to get that kind of information in uh, regarding housing. Uh, a medium density is, is so a medium density is typically your your duplexes and triplexes, um, a, you know, not not the apartment complex with you know 30, 60, 100 units. That would be the R3. It's based on the density. And so that is um, the R2 could fit into uh, closely with an R1 zone, which is a single family residence, residential zone. Um, they can blend nicely together. Um, sometimes the R3, you know, as a planner and, and, and for housing, you want, you'd love to have a mix of the high density of single family residence, residential and the medium density. However, that's not always realistic. Um, so we work with what we have. So in a, Especially like um, take Weaverville for example, the medium density is intermixed with single family residential, and uh, it it I would like to see more of it actually built on. So those are those homes are there, but as um, Mr. Ryan explained, a lot of these lots are sitting there, right. not being built on. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but if you know the R3 is just your highest density possible as much as your infrastructure can allow. And the medium is between, you know, the single family residential and apartment condos, the higher density. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. 
about it. Um, I recommend. Are you recommending and making it? I up? beg your pardon. I move that we adopt a resolution recommending to the Board of Supervisors um, a change to Chapter 17.17, which trying to sort through all the attachments. The resolution 2020-09 you're asking us to go for recommends to adopt the following environmental finding and recommends to make way to change the ordinance. And the ordinance, the resolution looks fine. The ordinance is where I need to break down. All right, I think I see what I'm I move that we um, adopt a resolution recommending the Board of Supervisors to amend Chapter 1717, that resolution is 2020-09, as is in the staff report. Uh, and that that resolution uh, recommends the adoption of an ordinance change, and an ordinance that changes the zoning law, but I would amend the draft ordinance that's in the attachment to delete triplex and move those back under Section 1717-020 as requiring a permit. However, so the, the uses permitted by right would be two single family structures or duplexes. Um, and that we find that these amendments are not subject to CEQA under the general rule of exception, which exempts activities where it can be seen with certainty there's no possibility of causing a significant effect on the environment. We have a motion. I'll second your motion. We have a motion and a second. Any competing motions or further discussion? Okay, while well we're discussing, I'm. I would. Uh, would anybody be interested in tackling the condominium issue? I'll, I'll go ahead and do a com I'll do a competing motion. Um, I move that we find that the amendments to Chapter 17.17 of the Trinity County Code is not subject to the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA under the general rule exemption 15061. B3, which exempts activities where it can be seen with certainty that there is no possibility of causing a significant effect on the environment, and that the Board of Supervisors approve an ordinance to amend the zoning code of the County of Trinity identified in Zone Amendment DEV 2020-03 with the change that Section 17.17.010 reads two single family structures and duplexes and triplexes. And that section 17.17.020 read point zero two zero A read single family dwelling, hospitals, rest homes, sanitariums, and clinics. We have a competing motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have two motions and two seconds. Any further discussion? Yeah, my concern with that second motion is that I believe we're <coughs> overstepping what we can change in the, with the finding that there's no... Um, it's a common sense exemption. Yeah, I don't believe that that exemption applies when we increase the density in a zoning district by right. And we've done that with this last motion. I don't have too much heartache over condominium, but I think it's sort of a gratuitous change at this point that we ought to postpone until we do the full-on update to the thing. So I, I don't necessarily agree with doing it, but I don't necessarily object to doing it. But 
the one I do find I have hard ink with is the track links in the uses by right. I, I agree with Commissioner McEwen on the track list. Right, well, we will. Can I amend my motion then? You are welcome to do that. Okay, then I will. I will amend my motion to remove. I can see your point. I can to remove triplexes from um, uses permitted under 17.17.010 and add triplexes under 17.17.020A um, to be single family dwelling, hospitals, rest homes, sanitariums and clinics, and triplexes. And remove condominiums. And remove condominiums. Okay, so we have an amended motion, and I believe you were the one that seconded that. Okay, I'll second that. Okay. Now, any further discussion? Um, so we will, this will be a roll call vote once again, and we will be starting with Commissioner Stewart's I. motion. Oh, no, okay. I'm not calling for the vote. We're, <laughs> okay. we're voting on your vote yes. to begin with. Yes, I was, I was just kind of daydreaming for a second. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Commissioner McHugh. There was a memo that accompanied this item um, that was sent out to the Planning Commission. Has everybody received that? I did, yes. Okay. And it was available to the public as well. Um, at the request of the applicant, um, uh, Jeff Mc McPherson, um, there was a re request for a continuance. The applicant currently has a Public Records Act request in with the Planning Department for uh, records and past records and correspondence on this item for like additional time um, uh, to get those records and review those. Um, so um, with that, um, we do uh, recommend continuing to a date uncertain, um, but this was agendized and noted in the public hearing. And the um, applicant, or the appellants, uh, sorry, the appellant, uh, Consultant, uh, authorized representative is here, Bilderberg, Scott Hawkins, and uh, can answer any questions if you do have any. But again, re request a uh, continuous to a date uncertain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions to staff before we open the public comment? Okay, we will open the public comment on agenda item number five. Anybody care to speak? Scott Watkins from Hayport. Um, 
we, the applicant did request that this item be continued. The staff report reads that um, uh, he should have appealed the decision in 2018, which he did. Um, and there is some uh, question as to the result of that appeal, uh, which is why the public records request was requested. Uh, the due date on the public records request was August 10th. We were hoping to have that information before this hearing. Uh, the county council requested uh, an extension, which we um, allowed, and so the extension is for another two weeks, August, week and a half. August 27th, I Something like that, yeah, 27th, that sounds right. So uh, we're requesting uh, that this matter be continued until after the public records request has been fulfilled. And and in time to review those records as well. Okay. So you're not asking for us to move it to a date certain? Uh, correct. We, you know, we have to look at the information before we'll uh, have an idea of the timing. All right. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? And then we'll bring it back to the commission. Make a motion to continue this to a date uncertain. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number six appeal of planning director's decision P 20 22. was an issued license that was uh, revoked. The appellant and uh, licensee Monica Henschke is present uh, with representative um, Jim Underwood in the audience and can answer any further questions. Um, the appeal to um, the decision to revoke the license uh, was based on an inspection on May 27, 2020, which identified four violations of subsections, um, subsections of Section 7 of the Trina County Ordinance. That uh, revocation letter is attached and outlines um, on the second page the violations that were found. Those were cultivating without a state cannabis license within 90 days of receiving a county commercial cannabis license. Two, the use of five hoop houses without building permits. Three, the use of recreational vehicle without first obtaining a director's use permit. And four, the use of recreational vehicle for ongoing human habitation without first installing a permitted septic system. Um, there is also a letter in your staff report from Mr. Underwood. Um, and in that letter, he does claim there had been uh, ongoing compliance uh, with the uh, appellant and former licensee, Ms. Henschke. Um, there is a record of ongoing non-compliance issues on this property, and staff um, disagrees with that assessment. Um, in September of 2018, there was a non-compliance, that non-compliance was cleared. However, again, that was five hoop houses without permits. Over canopy, over the 10,000 square foot canopy, the canopy measured at that time was 18,387 square feet. A notice, again, a notice of non-comp was issued. This was cleared, um, the hoop houses were removed. The cannabis cultivation was not abated. Um, it was harvested. The plants were not removed, um, so those plants were harvested and, and sold. Um, so that's how the cultivation was cleared. Um, then, um, fast forward to um, May 2020, again we have the five hoop houses, and um, also again, uh, sorry, it's wrong. <laughs> Um, op uh, operating cultivating without a state license and um, the RV use without a director's use permit or set septic. So um, there has been non-compliance issues in the past and staff disagrees that this applicant had been in compliance. Staff
staff recommends that um, the appeal be denied. Thank you. Any questions of staff? So in, in the situation where you find someone non compliant, mm -hmm. uh, how much time is, are they given to cure? Seven the, days. They're given seven days. Right. And so that process was followed, right? The process was followed for which? So they were advised of these defects, given seven days, and then, <coughs> and then you revoked their license. Is that correct? Correct. So on this latest violation, did they, um, when was the, the notice given? The notice was given in the staff report. And so they would have had till the beginning of this June, like the, sometime in the first week of this June, to to um, that was May 27th, 2020. Correct. correct. Okay. Uh, they would have had seven days after that, and was that notice given? Is it handed to them? Is it mailed? Is it certified mail? What? It is certified mail. Okay. And and, and emailed. Okay, and, and you have you have the receipt from the certified mail yes. to show that it Absolutely. Was, was in fact snapped and received. Okay. I do have one question that you were um, we're talking. It says there's cultivation without a state license. They do have their county CCL. Mm -hmm. um, the use of a recreational vehicle for human habitation without a septic, how did they get their county cultivation license if they didn't have a permitted dwelling on their property? Um, they can have a building permit. So, but in order to get that building permit, they would have had to have the director's permit for the RV. So there's No, 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 it doesn't necessarily go that way. Um, they can't get the director's use permit for the RV until they have a the residential permit. permit. So there's, they have a building permit on the property at the very least, in order to get the CCL. Yeah, I apologize. I I could look up in the file real quick. I am not sure if the building permit has been applied for on this property. Um, I, I, I I believe it has been. Yeah. Maybe the applicant can answer that question. That was just a, a question I had. And uh, any okay. other questions? Yeah. The um, September prior year. With the 2018, over, actually, yeah. I'm sorry, 2018, mm -hmm. with the over canopy, would have been given seven days to correct. Did they correct it within seven days? No. That harvest yeah. didn't occur within yeah. seven days. Absolutely. The 18,000. Um, according to our records, those plants were not abated. Um, they were able within to cultivate days. through the year. There was not follow up at that time. The 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 is abatement. Um, the clearing of the non-compliance came because it was at the end of September. It was the 28th of September and the harvest took place is my understanding. And that's what the record reflects. And what was the date? It was September 28th. And no, September. that, that, the, that the, um, the notice was given. Uh, the non-compliance notice yeah. in 2018? It would have been, but I will check. Yes, it was issued on September 28th. The non-compliance notice was issued on September 28th. Right. And when did they clear their um, their plants? I don't, I'm not sure when they harvested. Okay, because because even if they cut them down and sold them, 
within that seven days, they, that's still abatement. Yes, but they did not, it's my understanding they did not cut those hills. Do we have, but, but we don't, do we know that for a fact? Um, I'm not sure what happened in 2018. Um, I know, you weren't here. So, um, so the thing is, that compliance was cleared. Okay. One way or another, it was cleared. However, um, the, in Mr. Underwood's letter, he um, states that she's had, you know, this licensee has had a history of compliance. So I only bring this non-compliance up because okay, to because illustrate the fact that, no, there has been compliance issues in the past. Okay, I understand. So for clarity, when there's a violation and there are seven days to abate their nuisance or um, out of compliance, uh, isn't it the farmer's responsibility to call the county and invite them out to witness that it's been abated? Is that the process? Mary Beth says yes. They, they, they go, go back and reinspect the mm -hmm. and whether or not the yard guys are code compliant. And was, and was there a reinspection of? I don't know because I was. I can tell you that in 2018, there were issues with reinspection. Okay. Okay. Do we have any further questions of staff? Or do we want to open this for public comment? All right. Seeing that, we will open this to public comment. Good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, let me just quickly address the non-compliance issue of 18, because really in my letter I was I was focusing on the existing license and that which is subject to revocation. And I will concede, even in in recent months, there were some violations, and I tried to explain the context for those. Um, the, the the 18 issue isn't really before the commission, excepting as it may relate to a history of compliance. Okay. Um, I understand from the property owner who's here, Monica Hedgeke, that, that uh, the uh, violations that were brought to her attention back in 18 were fully abated within seven days. Uh, again, I don't think that's uh, directly pertinent to, to the matter uh, before you tonight. Uh, what is particularly important is this issue of notice, because the staff report does a good job of identifying the ordinance language uh, relating to violations. Um, and, you know, for purposes of the licensing question here, there were technical violations. Um, what didn't uh, get included in the staff report, and what I couldn't find in the record, and what I don't believe exists to my knowledge, is an actual notice of violation giving a seven day period within which to cure which is Part B of the ordinance language that's stated in the, in the staff report. And that is, that's a prerequisite to revocation. I mean, in fairness, um, if, if it's brought to a license holder's attention that there are problems and they don't take care of it in a timely way, as in seven days, it ought to be revoked. Um, I believe that the, the uh, the attachment to the staff report um, that is the notice of revocation was the first notice, written notice, to the license holder of, of violations. And um, had she got a seven day notice, as had occurred back in 18 on a different property, um, it would have been cured. I mean, there's too much of risk not to. It, it wouldn't have made sense. And so, in this case, I mean, I, I may have missed it in the file if, if the planning director, Kim, has, has a copy of a separate notice of violations and seven days within which to cure, you know, I, I'd appreciate seeing that because I, I don't believe I have. Um, and importantly, that's, that's a, a really important procedural prerequisite to revoking license. And it's just a matter of procedural due process. 
So, I mean, this is a this is a property owner who's tried to become licensed. Has she gotten it right all the time? No. Um, has she had some challenges even recently? Um, some relating to her own personal health, some relating to the weather that prevented getting the septic system in. Everything's abated. Everything has been brought current, and, and whether or not anyone's been out to inspect that, I don't know, but they would confirm that uh, were that to have occurred. I don't have any um, further thing to add, but I'd, I'd be glad to answer questions if you might have. And Ms. Hanschke is here as well. Thank you. Um, if I can ask one more question of staff. Well, we're in public comments. You, you can, when we bring okay. it to the commission, that'll be fine. Um, I do have one question for the applicant that I asked staff. Um, is there a building permit on the property or a permit yeah, there dwelling? Is. Okay. Yes, there is. Thank you. You're welcome. And there is now, uh, regarding the septic, I got the CUP in January. From January until I finally got the septic approved, I went to multiple people. It's a remote property. It was very difficult to get somebody. I finally got Mary Shaw. And then he was unable to do the septic right away because of the weather. And there's a letter that he gave to Mr. Cody, making the staff aware that he could not put in the septic right away because of the weather. And at the time, I was told by Mary Beth that that was acceptable. Here's, I'm sure you have a copy of this. Um, so it took Larry Shaw that uh, septic permit was issued in February 19 of 2020 and it took me until um, I don't have it but until June to get the whole thing I have a date here somewhere I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, so the septic is now fully, was inspected in May, in March, preliminary inspection, and then the final inspection was it's been completed. The director's use permit was started in March. It was very difficult. It's a very remote property. It takes two hours from here to get there, and it's hard to get people to come and do work there. And vis-a-vis -vis the 2018 violation that was completely abated within the seven days, Jeff Hickey, Jeff Dickey said it would be acceptable for us to send photos, and we did. And those plants were cut down before they were restored in order to uh, comply with the canopy. I had people helping me, and I thought the canopy was within what it was supposed to be. But it was completely evaded within that time period. And they should have the photos. Thank you. Any further public comment on this item? Another question from the applicant. The yes. Five hoop houses that seem to recur this year um, without building permits. Is it your intent to get building permits and use hoop houses, or will you stop using hoop houses? If I if I have a permit to plant again, I will most definitely get permits for the hoop houses. I thought I was told that the hoop houses were. I wasn't there because of my health issues. That they were the non-permitted. And no, I will definitely make sure that any new houses that are there are completely permitted. Period. And they've been taken down in the meantime. Okay. They do not exist at this point. Okay. We will bring the side back to the commission. Excuse me. Um, so on the next one, 
you have attached a copy of the certified mail receipt. There is not one on here. one, the certified mail receipt tag is on the letter of revocation. The important one that we have to make sure it was received timely was the notice of not compliance. It starts the seven day clock. I think that's the important one. And that's what I'm asking. That's what I exactly what I'm asking for. That, that we don't have we don't have a copy of the certified mail delivering that notice of, of find the certified mail for 2018 issue. Sorry? I can only find the certified mail received for the 2018 notice of non-compliance. I cannot find it in the file for the notice of violation. Without, without that, I find it very difficult to uphold your, uh, your denial of the on your uh, notice of non-renewal of May 27, I guess the inference you want us, you'd like us to take is that that occurred after the seven-day period expired, so all of that was in earlier May, the notice of non-compliance, the seven-day expiration, and then your decision to revoke. That's the sequence you, you, you that's how it happened according to your file. Um. According to the file, we just issued a letter of revocation with the seven-day cure period. No notice of violation was issued. So the seven-day cure period starts with the notice of revocation or a notice Correct. of non-compliance? The notice of revocation. It started with the notice of revocation. There was no other correspondence sent prior. Mr. Underwood is correct. But, but still, without something proving that, that she received that notice of revocation, it would be very difficult to, to um, uphold. Mm simply the, the, the second paragraph of the section is referred to in the ordinance says applicants shall be given up to seven business days after date of written notification to correct defects prior to revoking the license. And, there, and there's no reference to seven days and the notice of revocation. It's not there. 
in, in any case, I'm I'm going to uh, with, without any any anything showing that she was given a, a starting date for her seven days to to complete any um, amendments to her property that needs to be done. I I see no no option but to to move that. And I'm not quite sure how to word it, but that Caleb, that, pardon? Yeah, that we we uphold that we approve her her um, renewal of her her um, Cal, her CCL three three one commercial cannabis cultivation license. That was a motion. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or competing motions? I'll make a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we uphold the appeal and leave whether or not to reach the license up to the plan. Uphold the appeal. Yes, we uphold the appeal. Uh, that's basically what I. It's the same thing he says. Yeah. Didn't mention the Except license number. You went on and reissued the license, and I don't think that's our. <laughs> I uphold the. I would move we uphold the appeal. Um, of this denial. Then, then I will. Um, so we have a, a competing motion. Do we have a? Actually, I'm going to withdraw my motion because that's it's basically the same. So I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion competing motions? Not we and then all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, none. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Moving on, agenda item number seven. Appeal uh, to planning director's decision P-20-25. Okay, so um, this is a um, license application that was in process. It was not, the license had not been issued yet. This is, the appellant is, um, is he present? Anybody here representing this item? I want to make sure I, I mess up the name. Sarki? Sarki Um This uh, location was 800 Mountain View Drive, Lewiston. Assessor's parcel number 025 to 219-00. Uh, this um, cultivation uh, was occurring on the site prior to issuance of the license and therefore the application was denied. Um, do you have the certified mail with this one? Um, and photos, and um, then the um, explanation by the appellant on their appeal is um, that proper notice and noticing, the notice fails to provide pictures, descriptions of buildings or location that were a violation of said code se sections. And the staff recommendation is to um, uphold the denial, planning director's denial of the cultivation license based on cultivation without a license. What is this picture? It's far away. It's far away. <laughs> what is the picture of? It's a picture of uh, greenhouses with cannabis plants. Yeah, because I see nothing there. They're surrounded by oak trees. Okay. Uh, so did 
a staff member or a code enforcement person go no. onto the property, or did, was was it viewed at a significant distance? I'm just curious. I mean, was that picture as close as anyone got? Evidently, yes. Yeah, because if this is this if these pictures are supposed to be proof, uh, it's pretty sad. They aren't pictures of anything. I couldn't even tell they're trees. This is the only group that there is cultivation occurring? Uh, that is the only group I have in the file, correct. Do you have a statement from who the uh, compliance person? I do not, and in the future I will make sure they are present for these items. Well, at least they should memo the file on what they found. Absolutely, and finding that the case as well. Um, there are some pictures, they're, they're the same pictures, um, they're not there much better. And they certainly don't show anything growing inside of them. <laughs> not that you can see. Seven up to public yeah. comment. Oh. Yeah, actually, I do have a question. Another question. Oh, yeah. so, before so, we before we open public yes, comment. Yes, please. Right. Um, so, did the the uh, person who did the inspection actually go into these greenhouses? Um, no, the, I I don't have confirmation. They actually went onto the parcel, onto the property, and the greenhouses. I. We don't have that testimony again moving forward. We need to have yeah. much more substantial evidence when we make these decisions. Okay. And pictures that you can actually understand what's going on. Okay, now we will open public comment on agenda item number seven. Good evening. Um, I, uh, Jim Underwood, I represent a couple of, um, well, several property owners including Laurel and Steve Edwards who are here and may comment separately tonight, and a number of folks who um, also live in or near the Mountain View subdivision in Lewiston area uh, that is in the vicinity of, of this uh, growth site. Um, I would note on the, on the question that was posed by a few commissioners, the response or the, the actual documentation provided by the appellant seemed to suggest that he had cured the alleged violation, so there was at least a, some sense of, of, of admission that there were pre-existing violations. Nonetheless, um, I have a letter that explains why the Edwards and numerous other neighbors um, support the uh, planning director's decision in this matter, and uh, that's all I really wanted to know for the commission, unless you have questions about the proximity of properties. I would note as stated in the letter that this is the kind of project, uh, because it seems to be interconnected with other cultivation sites in Lewiston, that really would be appropriate to have uh, some fairly extensive level of environmental review if it were to be approved. I mean, it's really one of those uh, very disruptive traffic, noise, dust, and light with vehicles between different sites in Lewiston all the time. And, and so, in any event, um, the Edwards and many neighbors support what uh, Planning Director Hunter did in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Good evening, Chair Commissioners. Um, just as a public watcher here, at the very least, I think this item should be continued. Um, but there's no evidence that I can see in the staff report that shows there's plants in there. Um, and so when we're talking about revoking a license for somebody, just speaking as a professional who deals with this all the time, it's their livelihood, right? And so if you're going to make that action happen, you should definitely have some solid proof behind it. 
um, in order to take that action. I think we just saw that with the last item. So I would like to just point that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laurel Edwards. I do live in the Lewiston uh, Mountain View subdivision. My husband and I have lived there for 28 years. We've lived in Lewiston for 32 years. And I'm here representing um, a lot of my neighbors who are really unhappy with um, the commercial activity, co commercial cannabis activity that's going on in Lewiston and specifically in our residential area. Um, I'm going to work really hard to change your minds about issuing permits uh, or even um, uh, accepting applications for per commercial permits in residential areas. It has really um, changed the way our, uh, our life has been in seeing the traffic, the um, concerns we have about water, um, the non-communal type of people that are um, moving in and um, we're just really unhappy. We hope that it gets changed. Um, 28 years ago when we moved in, we thought it would be our forever home and it's not turning out the way we thought it was going to be. And, um, and we haven't even lived there the longest. It, uh, we have uh, much older and um, much uh, longer residents that have lived there that are just up in the air about what to do and maybe a little bit afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Do you mind if I ask you, um, how close are you to, are you a, a next door neighbor to this property? Not next door, um, quarter of a mile? Quarter of a mile. So yeah, the traffic goes by, right by our property. On the same driveway. All, all the time. Yeah, and and as the crow flies, maybe a quarter of a mile. A quarter of a mile. Okay, thank you. Yeah. My name's Steve Edwards. I live in Lewiston, Mountain View area. Quality of life when I moved there was very nice. Quality of life in this county is not very nice now. It's changed. It's changed a lot. I don't know how long you folks have lived here. I've lived here, as my wife said, at the Mountain View area for 28 years. Lived here a total 32 years. And it was been a good county for me but it has changed, and it hasn't changed for the better. That Mountain View road that goes in through our subdivision goes to the top of the canyon, and there's no egress besides that road. One road in, one road out. You all seen what happened in Paradise here a few years ago. I worked for Cal Fire for 16 years, and we talked about that problem in Paradise the whole time that I worked for them, and it finally happened. Same thing could happen in Lewiston. Traffic is a problem. People that want to go out and take a nice walk, lots of traffic going through, and some of it isn't really going very slowly. Some of it's going way too fast. The roads in there, are not taken care of by the county. The one main road in is. From that point, it branches off into several different roads. Those are all private roads. The county has no uh, business taking care of them. So it has affected, affected our, our quality of life. And that's one of the reasons why we moved up here was to get this nice quality of life that we had in Trinity County. Well, it's not so quality now. And I think that uh, people need to think about other folks that live in this county that don't grow. 
I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. John Brower from Junction City once again. And, um, it, yeah, as you wrestle with this, uh, please keep in mind that the creation of our cannabis ordinances did exclude cannabis licensing in residential zoning, but did not exclude it from rural residential zoning in keeping with our uh, cottage industry ordinance. And we are talking about livelihoods in the in typically one of the very poorest counties in the state. So please be mindful that there is a difference between residential zoning and rural residential zoning. The cottage industry ordinance uh, is very clear. Um, and uh, please be mindful of that as you, you do wrestle with this tough one. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, member of the commission, Tom Belanco, Douglas City. Um, I don't really have any familiarity with this site or, or the package. I did just want to follow up with what uh, Anna mentioned about you know having some verification um, and you know I understand code enforcement probably has some different uh, standards they adhere to when they're looking at an abatement for an unlicensed parcel they have to look from a public uh, area uh, but anybody in the licensing program even at the application stage has uh, signed a consent and authorization to enter private property so um, that may be something worthwhile, like you, we could get more information about this rather than uh, one blacked out photo and find out that uh, county officials are allowed to go on there if they're in the licensing program. So it may be appropriate to continue that until you get further information. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we will bring it. Close public comment and bring this back to the commission. I think continuing this is probably a good idea. Um, so I would move that we continue item number seven until we can get clarification on um, just exactly what is happening. I don't know how soon that could occur um, if we want to do it. I would just continue it to a, a, an unknown date in the future, I think, because unless you think we can have it by... We can have more information by the September 10th meeting. Okay, then I would suggest that we continue it to the September 10th meeting, or move that we continue it to the September 10th meeting. Do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Any competing motions or further discussion? None. Motion and a second. Uh, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? None. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Moving on. Okay. Before needs? before we go on, I need to okay. excuse Any, myself. Anybody need a recess? We will take a short recess before we go on to agenda item number eight. Okay, we will reconvene the regular August thirteenth meeting in Trinity County Planning Commission. Agenda item number eight. And then I, agenda item number eight, hopefully I can get through this one. Um, this is a license um, that was noticed and um, had gone through the process. It's a new license. The um, applicant was um, RBR Agricultural Enterprises, um, Raymond Levasseur. Um, he's in the back there. And um, the License applicant's representative is also present, Flora. 
Um, the appellant is um, Mary Bowers and Carl Fisher. So the appeal is the planning director's decision to approve a commercial cannabis cultivation license CCL-2020-671 for a small mixed light cultivation operation, which is a type two license. The site location for the proposed um, license is uh, 241 North Vista Lane, Hayfork. Assessor's parcel number 014-360-13-00. The acreage of the site is approximately 7.5 acres. The zoning district is rural residential minimum 5 acre RR5. And uh, the general plan designation is rural residential. Um, the staff recommendation is to uphold the approval of the commercial cannabis license, CCL number 671 as the requested use complies with the provisions established by the Trinity County Commercial Cannabis Cultivation Ordinance number 315-843, which allows for limited cultivation within the rural residential zoning district. Any questions? Any questions, staff? Um, we will open agenda item 8 to public comment. Anyone care to comment? You mind if I pull this off? <laughs> I don't talk very loud anyway, so um, it's hard to hear me sometimes. So anyway, um, I'm just going to work off this uh, rebuttal that the uh, uh, I guess it was um, the Anna Wright put together. <clears throat> it's got uh, some false and misleading information in it. Um, it references a lot of uh, state codes and and uh, such and CEQA. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through this. Kind of, I'm not going to hit every item, but uh, some of them that I think need to be looked at and. Just to start out, I'd like to discuss the rural, uh, rural residential um, zoning. And maybe we could pass this out so it's nice and fresh. I don't think anybody has their zoning manual with them at this point. Um, my wife and I. Uh, wanted to get out of an urban area, <clears throat> we're looking for rural property to, uh, to live on, and we spent a couple, a little over a couple of years looking around Northern California on the west side of the valley, um, and didn't find much that really appealed to us. Uh, we ended up um, uh, working with a realtor in, in Weaverville, saw a number of properties here very nice, but none of the none of the homes really met our lifestyle. So there was a, a vacant parcel in Hayfork, and um, it was perfect for what we wanted. Um, and so we purchased that in 2005. Uh, it had um, it had domestic water from the water district. Um, it was close to downtown, but it was still rural. It was undeveloped, uh, so we could build the house we wanted and meet, meet our lifestyle. And it was zoned rural residential. Um, and so, <clears throat> looking at that zoning, um, number one, it, it, I think it's important to look at what the framers intent was for, for that zone. Uh, they obviously named it rural residential, not rural commercial, not rural mixed use. Um, use the you know, permitted use is one family dwellings. The agricultural uses except those requiring a use permit, da 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 da. And if you look at it carefully, they have spent a lot of time and effort in going through. Uh, um, different animals that you could have on the property and it, it limits the number of each type of animal per so many square feet. Obviously the intent was to not allow something to get out of hand and have a public nuisance. Uh, they even um, 
They even say that uh, the square foot is used for one category, couldn't be used for any other. So, you, so if you had a horse and you, you had to have 20,000 square feet, um, that 20,000 square feet is out of the picture if you want to have chickens or whatever else. So looking at that intent, um, I think that uh, the board kind of overstepped the bounds on this. And um, I, I think knowing the current board over these last four years, I know why that was. Uh, and I think the argument I'm giving you was presented in court, court by a, 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 an attorney. I think we would win a case in court against the county. So that's that one. The other one is, just going down a little further, they talk about the Hay Fork Water District, which is not in the car belt. look at this document. This is an excerpt from the uh, Trinity County Commercial Cultivation Ordinance. And it has to do with the car valve. The county which was going to do 500 licenses somehow magically um, decided 540 was the better number. And we know that came from uh, the District 3 supervisor who won an election built on a campaign of out and out lies and promises that she couldn't keep. You probably, some of you are familiar with that. So somewhere along the line over the last four years, um, she was able to, with the help of another supervisor on the board, uh, who are, um, I don't know the political way to put it, but maybe a little more involved in the, in the marijuana industry uh, than they should be as supervisors. So, again, somewhere along the line, <clears throat> although the water district in Hayfork was in the carve out in the original ordinance and I know it for a fact because I was on the board at that time when that emergency ordinance was put together and the reason for the carve out was that um, the county knew for many years before with all the illegal grows and all that kind of stuff the biggest problems was the interface between uh, marijuana grows and and um, basically properties that are in areas of neighborhoods, um, uh, high, higher density population areas. So the board at that time um, decided that there needed to be a carve out. And the carve out, as you can see, is for areas of higher population density. And they list them here. We were real community service uh, district, uh, Coffee Creek Volunteer Fire Department, Trinity Center, Community Services. Uh, let's see. Um, where are all of the, uh, the Lewiston uh, Community Service Districts, plus they list a number of other areas. And it says, which are in proximity to high density areas and therefore create a substantial risk of public nuisance. Um, our friend in the third district got, uh, through manipulations, um, got the um, A Fork district taken out of the car now. And that came from a lot of threats on her life because she wasn't able to produce the promises that she'd made and they found out that she was lying about a lot of things that they believed in um, and it came back to bite her on the next election because she lost heavily to somebody in in uh, Douglas City and so she lost most of her support in the paper. So, uh, 
I think the 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 whole thing of the, the water district not being in is, is, is just corruption. Uh, 350 foot setback. Uh, I'll come back to that, but that was just kind of a number that was pulled out of the air at the time. And go down a lot. A lot of the CEQA stuff and and uh, different state codes. I think all of you have been in Trinity County long enough that these exist, but we all talk about them. They're the one size fits all. And it doesn't, most of them frequently do not apply to this county. And I'll point out a couple places where that's the fact. Uh, aesthetics. It says, absent evidence to refute the state's findings, tell us argument, cultivation, impact, local aesthetics, which is moot. Oh, I, we do usually, we should have a three minute timer. But the, um, as this is the no, this is the appellant. So we, we will give him, he has more than three minutes, and and the the response from the um, applicant they the response, they will have more than three minutes also. So we probably really it shouldn't be considered public comment period right now. It's more of the. Appellant speaking, then the applicant okay. speaking. Well, that's why I was slow getting up because I thought the public comment yeah. would come after these. Yeah. So that's that's where the that is. So he he will have more than three minutes. Okay. So uh, absent evidence to uh, refute the state's findings, uh, arguments that cultivation impacts local aesthetics is moot. Uh, the first picture is um, uh, these bright white hoop houses. Uh, this one is across the gulch from us, a little bit to the south. Um, we don't see it too much when the oak leaves are out, but all winter they glare at us. This one is just being built, it's directly west from, from our property, again across the gulch, and that one we can't miss. Uh, the next page is two hoop houses, fairly new. They're on a property uh, adjacent to ours, to the north. Um, and fortunately, from our deck where we spend a lot of time, um, we can't see it when the oak leaves are out. But obviously, the rest of the year we can. Um, and we're not too worried about that. Um, the aesthetics is terrible that it doesn't go with uh, a residential neighborhood. But um, we're not typically bothered by the, uh, the odors or anything. And I'll explain why later. The next picture is um, the south border of our property. And if you you may not have seen uh, how these parcels are laid out, but they're 300 feet wide and about 1,100 feet deep. Um, and the 300 foot is along the roadway. Anyway, this is along the, the uh, 1,000 or 1,100 foot side, the south side. Where the uh, pine rounds are down there, hoop houses would probably be built from there going west, which is towards the right side of that page. And this picture was taken from our deck, so they'd be very, very visible to us. The next page is two hoop houses, uh, which is what the Bowers get to look at from their house. Uh, not, I, I just don't think they fit in a residential area. That's not what you typically see. That's industrial type of uh, buildings. Okay, moving on. There's an indication here about um, water quality. Um, I'm, I think the, the chance of water quality, and what, if something happened, it would be going into the Hayport Creek. Uh, there is a uh, seasonal creek that goes through this uh, gorge, and um, I think that's not much of a problem. What is a problem for us in the neighborhood is uh, quantity of water as far as volume and pressure. And I will show you a picture. Sorry, Mary. Um, 
These are two water tanks that were built and constructed for the neighborhood in that area which takes up North Vista Road and Murray Lane. <coughs> and not a lot of houses on those. There's not a lot of parcels. Uh, they're both dead end streets. And um, they served quite well uh, for the neighborhood. And then uh, the upper end, the north end of, of North Vista Lane, uh, the people up there decided they wanted to join into the district. And so uh, they had to extend the line, main line up there. Well, above our house, I think almost every property is a commercial grove with the exception of out. I'm not sure. I think Mary moved there than I do. How many, how many, how many commercial grows above our property? I would say there's six of them. There's six of them. Five, six, uh, Five. Yeah. And how many parcels are up there? Uh, maybe nine. Um, we're kind of rambling here. Can we? No. Anyway, okay. So what happens is um, when they start irrigating, <coughs> They have no water pressure. My wife will go out and put a, 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 a sprinkler on the ground to water something, turns it on, and it's like four or five feet out. You go back a little later, and it's been sucked down, and it's this much area. The, the system can't handle the amount of water that's being taken out for irrigation. Uh, going down a little further, traffic and dust. Uh, it says the road and trucks would have to drive on is paved all the way until right before the applicant's home. And that's false. And I got I got accused in this rebuttal of not having proof or facts or anything. So that's why I'm presenting these pictures. Um, this is a picture of North Vista Lane right at the junction where the county road stops, which is paved, and our road starts. Obviously, you can see, I did it in black and white because it shows the gravel to <laughs> the uh, You can see that's a gravel road. Those little two arrows on the, each side is about the end line of the county road. The next picture is up on that next curve, and you can obviously see it's gravel road. The next picture is around the next curve, gravel road. And then this goes up a little past those arrows where there is a pavement. The people that own that property who have moved out um, paved in front of their property because of the dust problem and noise problem of gravel. And that's just a 300 foot stretch of paving. And then it turns to dirt again. Uh, we ended up putting, uh, have our section 300 feet paved for the same reason. Noise of the gravel is they just race up and down that road and the dust. Uh, okay, the open indication that uh, all the, the potential impacts of commercial cultivation could uh, have on traffic and dust have been ruled as less than significant by CDFA. Um, again, this, this is a one-size-fits-all, and I would agree with that statement if I was in Butte County or I was in Calusa County, where the roads have constant traffic that's pretty, pretty a lot of traffic. If you get down in most of the areas, and especially paid for, almost every road is dead end. So we know what traffic is. Uh, there's, you know, only so many houses, and when it comes co comes time for the season to start, the traffic more than quadruples. So that that statement just doesn't fit our territory. They're not talking about dead end roads. And as you probably know. In the summer season, when marijuana season starts, the population of this county increases by about 30%. Um, and I also am aware that the whole time I was on the board, 
uh, had many discussions with Rick Tippett the Transportation Roads, uh, and he was complaining all the time about the uh, damage that the uh, marijuana industry traffic was causing on his roads. So again, the, the one size fits all from the state doesn't fit most places here. Uh, the next page, she talks about smoke. Uh, sm no, it says smoke, but she's talking about wind. And one of her complaints is that the prevailing winds in that gulch are from west to southwest. They're out of the west to southwest. That's why the road to our north usually doesn't affect us, and I'm going to give you one time it did, and it caused a big problem. Um, and <clears throat> she just talks about this one to three mile an hour, one to seven miles an hour. This has gotten pulled out of the sky someplace. Um, so I want to show you this. We happen to have, have had for a number of years, a, um, it's a Davis Instruments weather station a fairly decent one. And so what I did was I printed out, is there enough? I have, I think I have one I don't need. Is there enough there? Okay. Um, so I printed this out. On the uh, right side, um, it gives you wind speeds. And on the left side, it gives you what what part of the compass the wind is coming from. And the time period, this is, uh, starts in August 2019 and goes through uh, July, and on the next page it shows July and August of this year. So <clears throat> the lighter colored blue are what are called the wind speed. The darker colored blue is high wind speed. And so you can see high winds, the, the, the low wind speed is up between 5 and 10 miles an hour. The high wind speeds go up to 25 miles an hour. And we get the most of the winds in summer and fall. It drops off in winter. The red is the direction the wind is coming from. And if you look at, like, it goes from west to west-southwest, it's almost a steady band of red. And we're talking winds that are up to 25 miles an hour most of the time, and once in a while they'll go up to 30. It's pretty constant. We've lived there for into our 14th year now. It hasn't changed. So this, this grow, uh, the odor from that grow will go directly to our house across the street to other properties there. There's, there's no way around it. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the, the property to our north. And it was about three years ago. Um, the prevailing winds tricked us. And they started coming out of the northwest. And so we were getting the odor from that grove. It was fall. And uh, Sometime that fall, I started having a heart problem, a tachycardia, uh, arrhythmia, uh, which is a very, very high heart rate, and it's a, um, a regular, irregular heartbeat. It has a pattern to it, but it's not a regular sinus rhythm. And I, I had it for two or three weeks, and I couldn't understand why. I mean, nothing was changed. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. We've been strong smell of marijuana of this whole time. So I contacted my cardiologist at Stanford and ha had them send me a heart monitor. Well, by the time the heart monitor got here, the crop had been harvested and processed, and it was off the property. The odor was gone, and about two or three days after the odor was gone, my heart went back to normal. I know I'm allergic to marijuana. I found this out in the early 60s. Uh, I can't smoke it. I get distressed uh, respiration, and I can't consume it. Uh, I was at a party where it was in the uh, uh, spaghetti sauce, 
didn't know about it. And late that evening, my wife told me they almost took me to the emergency room, but I started to get my breathing back again. So I know I have the allergy, and that thing with the tachycardia went away as soon as the odor went away. So, this is going to be constant every year from this, this side. As far as where the odor travels, if you do the math, 5,280 feet per mile, um, and you look at a 10 mile an hour wind, which we have a lot of, it travels 880 feet in a minute. At 5 miles per hour, it's half that, 440, uh, 440 feet in a minute. This is 350 feet away from us. Um, that minute doesn't give it any time to dissipate. If there was no wind, the odor does dissipate because of the partial pressure loss. Uh, it needs to find a constant um, uh, amount of, of uh, the uh, particles in the air, cup molecules. So all of this does not fit. That's not what we have here. And um, I will be back at the same thing if my heart does the same thing, which I feel it probably will. Um, and then I can document it with a heart monitor. But I don't think I should have to risk my cardiac health by having this grow next to me. Or I prove it's going to come right to me. So, and I don't feel like I should have to move to get away from it after spending 14 years developing uh, an undeveloped property. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. And now, we can hear from the applicant. Or the applicant's representative. Oh, oh. Either or. Yeah, we'd like to both so I think Yeah. Hi, my name is Ray Lavasser. Um, owner of the property we're talking about. I live in the valley, me and my wife and two sons were looking for a place to move, to retire. Okay, so last, about a year and a half ago, we started looking for properties up in Placerville, Tahoe, and we ended up coming across this property. And we did the research on the front end, saying what we could do and couldn't do on the property. Okay, we went through almost a year of going through and talking to people, talking with Flora, different things. We've gone through the whole process with the state. They've gone out and done all the testing, went out to the site. We think we've done everything we have to do on the front end. We followed every rule, every law, done everything that we've asked, okay, from the state and the county aspect. Okay, in doing, doing that, the reason we're moving up here, we have two boys. The youngest one's getting ready to go off to college. This is his senior year. My oldest son is autistic. And when I actually met with Mary back in April, and we were talking, about the reason I was moving up here, and they asked if we were going to do hoop houses. And we said, we're looking to. I go, we've already got our application in. we got to go through the process. We can't do anything until we get the final approval. And they were like, OK. And she asked, why? Well, I have, my oldest son is autistic, special needs. He's age four to five. OK, as a parent, you don't want the day to happen you're not there to take care of. The reason we bought this property, and the reason we want to do the family growth and the business, is to make money to put aside for him. So when we pass, we know he's taken care of. Somebody will be there to take care of him rather than putting him in a hole. Okay. I'm getting to the point where I'm getting ready to retire. This is something that we can do as a family. And we are trying to go by all the rules, do everything legal. And we did not see any appeal or anything coming out of that field. So we've done everything. We think we've done everything we can to be straightforward with everybody. Talk to everybody, and now this is coming out of left field, and it's, yeah, it's a little hard. So that's all I have. And you can see our notes from Flora 
my wife's got a memo in there. We've done a lot of research on the back end about the winds also. The water table, yes, it is those two towers you see the picture of. Our property, we're the last property. We're the lowest level. We actually have to have a pump with a separate power line to get us water pressure. So there's different ways to manage things and deal with things. And they continue to continue to keep selling properties above. Like there's a big lumber company in town. He just bought a huge lot up the hill that he's been building, his custom house. They keep selling those lots, but they're not fixing the water pressure. So could an application be denied because of that? I don't know. I mean, that's something that has to go with the county and affects everybody. I mean, it could be as simple as we have a separate tank that on the off hours, we do a slow trickle to fill that tank to do the watering during the day for the irrigation. There's certain things that can be done that people want to talk and work. This is an investment. This is something I'm trying to do for me and my family. And we've been going through all the steps to do everything legal. So I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so when do we get to? That's also the applicant. She's the wife. Oh, okay. Well, I guess you can pass her in if you can. Excuse me, we're, we're having a hearing right now. Thank you. Okay, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd also like to be able to go and look at some of the letters um, that were written. And I did file a memo, uh, which is attached. Um, uh, the, the appealants uh, were questioning power outages in the, in the area. And um, I'm sure, do you have the document in front of you? Do you have the memo that was attached? Uh. Attached to the staff brief board. Because, because I, I, I can't present that to you, but it, it was attached in the memo. Um, they had indicated that on June 28th that a transformer blew, and because it was overloaded. Um, I spoke to Kim at Trinity PUD. It was a fuse that blew. The reason's unknown. I get a Trinity County has a, what they call is a fire safety alert. And sometimes fuses would blow because of wind or a balloon or a bird or a, it's something that's a big piece of dust. They don't know why, but there's times where fuses will blow. Um, but it was not a transformer. And as you can see by the document, they're claiming that there's power, lots of power outages. There was only in the in the last year, I, and I printed. Um, that I was able to print from August 9th, August 2019 to current, there were only three outages. Well, there were five total, but two of them were scheduled. And in the last year, there was only one that happened in 2020. So I, 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 I just, I, I'm pointing that out. Um, I'd also like to point out that they were concerned about the water. I looked at the Trinity County Waterworks. They published their consumer confidence reports, which are available online. They're there from 2019 to 2015. On the, in their consumer confidence reports, there's no issuance of pesticides. But you did have E. coli in your water system in 2019. Uh, and then um, lastly, I, I, I don't know. The, the groomers mentioned that they're going to lose loss of income from their rental. Um, you know, it, it's a possibility, but when you're renting to your sister, family usually sticks with family, and I don't see that Wendy is going to leave her brother Lance. Can we please uh, only address the commission, do not address the... Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not addressing you. I'm, 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 I'm actually commenting to their letters that they... They're, I'm, so I'm responding to their letters that they wrote. 
So I'm not responding to them. I'm literally responding to their letters that they wrote where they said they were going to have loss of income. And they failed to disclose that they're renting to a family member. Um, but, I, you know, like Ray said, we're trying to do this as an investment. My son graduates this year. And we're going to be moving up there. And we're, we're, we're trying to do everything legal. We're trying to do everything in a positive way. Um, we've spoken to another neighbor that's next door. She asked us some questions, and we told her that we were going to be as discreet as possible and because she, she had concerns. And, and I said, trust me, I will, I will make sure that it's not going to limit what you what you consider a nuisance. And she and I had a wonderful talk, and, and we've been talking as a neighbor should talk. Um, but, you know, I'm, 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 it's our hope that you will continue to approve this. Um, we are here to do it legally. We don't want to do anything that's against the law, and I hope that you approve our license. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, Tom Belanco, attorney this time from Douglas City. Uh, and I want to make a threshold comment before we dig into the specifics of this. I am concerned about the Commission's time uh, for selfish reasons. I have my own stuff I want to see come before here. I got some CUPs pending. I want to see these get to the general plan updates. I don't want to see these CEQA appeals become variants 2.0. I know staff is overloaded, but we need a protocol about what gets you past the threshold on a sequel appeal. And that has got to involve some evidence, some data. At the minimum, an affidavit, something sworn under oath from even the appellant, something that says this is evidence. Expert opinion. The sequel guidelines say reviewing agencies or organizations should base their comments on facts, reasonable assumptions based on facts, or expert opinions supported by facts. We have allegations, and then we, we can't turn everybody who doesn't like cannabis saying, oh, I got a sequel appeal because it's going to be near me and that affects my environment. <clears throat> it's just, and, and the concept that rural residential might not be appropriate for cannabis. What a novel concept. Now, how many hours have we spent on that? Uh, I, the four of you, for sure, two of you in the audience and two of you up there, spent the better part of spring of 2016 on that very question. Uh, and then it made it into the ordinance. Rural residential is appropriate. And the signature on that ordinance is Carl Fisher. The other thing that ordinance says is 350 feet is sufficient to mitigate the nuisance conditions caused by cannabis. And we have been doing that for years now. There is more than 350 foot setback here. This is not the kind of issue that gives rise to a genuine secret concern. Uh, the applicant has come forward with all the requirements in the ordinance. It's approved, it's ready to go. Uh, I, I urge you to accept staff's recommendation, let this license go through, and I encourage the development of a protocol so we can avoid this becoming a, a another form of torture for you and us to have to go through all the time. Seek was important, and there are very valid considerations. They list 18 of them, and to get a sequel consideration, you have to bring some facts in there. If, if the standard were, I don't like it, there'd never be another truth cut in California. There'd never be another oil well, and there'd never be another infill project in any area. But that's not the sequel standard. You have to come forward with some actual evidence. Uh, so I, I encourage you to, uh, like I said, uh, deny this appeal, accept staff's recommendation, and, and let this license go. I think these applicants have done uh, everything they need to, and, and they ought to uh, receive the license they're entitled to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is 
I'll make it short and sweet. On our right, Flora. I appreciate all of you guys' time tonight hanging in there for this last item. I think Tom put it pretty well about facts. I want to point you to the only document that we have in Trinity County that guides us to these appeals. And that's the frequently, frequently Asked Questions page on the website. Letter, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five questions down and asks, what are the grounds for an appeal? And there's two reasons. <clears throat> Pardon me. One of them is non-compliance with the county ordinance, and the other one is non-compliance with CEQA. I think my letter does a beautiful job, I'm very proud of it, of laying out the facts based on the only valid CEQA document we currently have. Trinity County is still, as you guys well know, in the draft form of the EIR. So the only document that we can lean on to use as evidence is indeed CDFA, the state agency who regulates cultivation, nursery, and processing, their programmatic EIR. If you check that out, you can see where all my citations are. But that's why we're supposed to be here tonight, is to talk about facts about that. And it's true, the letter from the appellants don't speak on any factual basis. Yet CDFA has indicated all of these components of CEQA are less than significant to no impact. I look forward to seeing what Trinity comes up with in their EIR, and then we can then refer, excuse me, refer to that one. The ordinance is the ordinance. The state laws are the state laws, including Fish and Wildlife and Water Board, and this applicant has done everything. He even has a state license approved waiting payment for this indeed this hearing exactly. He has a family he wants to bring here and wants to take care of through this type of business. Just because this type of business not be, not, might not be everybody's cup of tea, but it's legal doesn't mean somebody shouldn't be able to do it. Tom already addressed the rural residential 350 foot setback. I want to point out that the most recent ordinance that was adopted on February 20th of 2019 does not include the Hayford Water District in the carve out. We have to go with the most recent ordinance with all the amendments that have happened since 2016. It's going to be number five, letter A, number seven in our Trinity County ordinance. And being surrounded by cultivation, I can see that. I would like to look into how many of those are licensed versus our applicant here who has gone through the process to do everything the right way versus everyone else um, the opponents refer to uh, in this case According to my knowledge, none of them are licensed. So we should really be only thinking about licensed parcels in the area. Um, and then going down, I'm not going to go through each CEQA part because it's there and it's clear. CDFA and the State Water Board and all the other state agencies have set very clear guidelines. And cannabis is not impactful in any of those areas. The wind one, I found, you can see my website I cited there. It was a study from the University of Maine. Um, I find that an accredited source. You're welcome to look that up, though. And the bottom line, I'm going to refer back to that frequently asked questions. Again, we're supposed to be here because the question of noncompliance with the county ordinance and the and question of noncompliance with CEQA, as you can see, everything is compliant. Until Trinity County has their own CEQA document, we have to follow the only valid one, and that's what we're doing here. In my conclusion, I want to point you to the uh, FAQ sheet that I specified, which is the, our only set of rules for appeals. does specifically state on page one that the Planning Commission does not have the lawful authority to consider any other grounds for appeal. I wish we didn't come to this spot. I wish this was really vetted beforehand, but here we are, and here's a great argument. You got two really great points, and I really truly believe that my letter shows you the sections of the law, of CEQA guidelines, of the CEQA statute that this applicant is following. He is ready to pay his state license fee as soon as he can receive his county license, move forward into next season, cultivating legally, and making money for his family and for his son. Here in Trinity County, we value family, we value community, and this is the best example right here with his licensee. I got chills when Ray told me that tonight. I didn't realize his purpose for moving here as his consultant. 
But that purpose right there, that's the epitome of where we live. We need to support each other, and we need to support each other's families. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are we in the public section? Now, we will take public comment. And to be clear, we will be timed now. Okay. My name is Mary Bowers, and I'd like to make a couple of things perfectly clear. One, I have never met the applicant ever in my life. I have never had a conversation with him at any time about his family, about his grill. Had he had the courtesy to walk over to my house and ask me about how I felt about him growing there, I would have had this conversation with him a long time ago. So, um, Anna, who wrote uh, her rebuttal letter to us, uh, is a heck of a researcher. That's all I can say. There's a language that goes with the cannabis grows that I am not familiar with. I'm just a lay person living out in the community trying to live a good life, and I don't know all these regulations. I don't know the language. I don't know uh, what they mean. So, with that, the first thing I have to say is that I was not given any of these things about the C qua that you guys are talking about. She goes on in here about the SWRCB, and there's a CDFA. I don't know any of those organizations. And when I went for uh, to the planning commission for the key, I mean the planning department for the appeal papers, what I was given was um, the Trinity County Cannabis Program notice of availability of a draft environmental impact report. That's what I was given. That was all I was given on which to base an appeal. And in there they talk about the significant results of air quality, water quality, land traffic, uh, cumulative effects, noise, dust, all those kinds of things. And that's what I based my appeal on. Now, I did not know that when I bought that property 29 years ago, I would have to sit down with a pencil and paper and write down every piece of traffic that went by and keep track of it to document it so that I could have documentation to come here. I didn't know I had to have a decibel meter so that I could understand, have, make you folks understand that the noise level in our neighborhood has gone up tremendously in the last 29 years. And I have to say that when all of these rules and regulations were made, not one person from Trinity County or the state of California came onto my property to measure those things either. So as Carl said, you're trying to make one size fits all. And in this case, the prevailing wind is the driving force behind this appeal. I live no closer than a thousand feet from any uh, greenhouse or cannabis grow right now, and every single day I smell growing cannabis on my property. 350 feet from the property line, that's not going to do it for me at all. Now, I understand that this man over here, uh, with his wife was up there, I'm assuming, that she said that I stated there will be lots of power outages and things like this, and on the June 28th, I called Trinity County PUD and asked them why the power went out. And I was specifically told that the power went out because it was overloaded. That was a hot day, and there are many, many greenhouses up there, and we added two more this spring. And that's why I assumed the power went out, and that's why I made the statement. Our infrastructure for power is not good enough to continue to add greenhouses after greenhouse after greenhouse. So the people from Lewiston are talking to you about the quality of life for folks who do not grow. I'm asking you to consider that too. Thank you. Thank you. Just quickly, I agree with Tom 100% that you need the facts. Uh, you already spoke, sir, so. But just, you, he said you, no facts. I gave you facts. And I will swear you've already you. had you've already had your time. You got facts though. Uh, commissioners, <coughs> uh, I encourage you to deny this appeal. Um, based on the, you know there are no uh, violations of uh, county ordinance. And there is no solid grounds on uh, any of the CEQA checklist items. Um, it, uh, it's an unfortunate situation. Uh, it sounds like uh, with uh, the neighbors, <coughs> perhaps the, uh, you know, once approved, the applicant uh, uh, could uh, 
sit down with the neighbors and, and you know if there's one particular strain of cannabis that is particularly bothersome to Mr. Fisher, um, perhaps uh, the applicant would consider avoiding cultivating that strain. Uh, same thing on the hoop houses. Uh, if that's the, the their biggest complaint, perhaps some you know, middle ground could be struck. But as far as approving the license, the applicant has met the requirements. And it's really the end of the story. So uh, thank you for the shine tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Can I say one thing real quick? You've had, you've had your time. I didn't talk to her. I actually talked to the baby next to her. Okay. Well. That would be me. Yeah. Wendy. Okay. Okay. Um, I actually started coming to the legal proceedings on marijuana in 2007 and watched all of this unfold. I'd like to um, note, and this is purely speculation, that the onus falls on the neighbor, not on the person who wants to come into the neighborhood and grow. I could care less if you're growing marijuana, okay? I don't care. But I do care that you guys give some consideration to the people who live in the area. Whether it's legal or not, I mean, there needs to be a lot of work done about what is okay and what's not. And there are many, many pet phrases that have been used this evening in an articulate, manner, a condescending manner, and I find it very interesting that a lot of the argument is about moral judgment. And yes, this guy's done the whole work. I'm proud of him. He told me he was going to move two people in to work the crop till he could retire. To who? Who? What people are you moving in? Number two, according to his wife. Um, she stated that I would never go against my brother. I'm the one that wrote. I'm the one that renting. Um, actually, we do that with quite a lot of regularity. So I don't really care for someone else talking about how I'm going to respond to my relatives. Okay? Um, I, don't, I think I'm going to have to start coming back to these more often because I can see how off track you guys are. It's very sad. It's sad to me that people who live in a neighborhood have to defend whether or not they should combat smells and prove that there's winds prevailing. You know, we're, this has gone a little south. To me, you want to grow pot, grow it like out, out somewhere, not in a neighborhood. And, and that is because we missed out due to one of our wonderful board of supervisors who managed to get hay fork cut out. I don't know, what's the proper term for it? Carved out? Carved out and punished. I don't know how it runs in Weaverville, but I very seldom see grows next door to houses, rural, residential, or otherwise. So my opinion is that if I hear, you know, working lives, and I'm saving money, and I'm you know, this is a living for these people. I don't care. That's great. Do it somewhere else in a true rural area. You guys don't give enough consideration to the neighbors or the people who are committed to the community. I live in a community where the money doesn't come back to the community except for maybe three places. So I really don't care about all these, well, there's this, this, and this, and he's followed every rule. That doesn't matter to me. Thank you. Thank oh, you. no, you don't have to stop me. I'll stop myself. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have anyone on there? All right. With that, we will close public comment and bring this item back to the commission. Was there anybody on on the Zoom meeting that wanted to comment? Well, Sherry put a couple of things. Okay, we haven't been checking with the Zoom. I've, I've been checking. You yeah. have? Okay. Good. I was even looking over there. Okay, we got to go. <laughs> so, commissioners.
Wow. <laughs> huh? <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I feel all the emotional appeals to all of all the neighbors. As a planning commissioner, we have to look at the general plan and the. No, okay. <laughs> or the zoning ordinance and the applicant is working within the zoning ordinance. I mean, I, I don't, while following the ordinance, I don't see how this can be denied. Part of planning is doing planning. And um, so sort of the cumulative effects of marijuana have been poorly handled, I think. Um, the cultivation has been poorly handled in any of the CEQA material I've seen. Um, part of the job is to look at the quality of the CEQA and how it applies to a particular case. And, um, and when a programmatic CEQA is applied, it is a broad brush and we do have the discretion to determine is it completely relevant or are there additional factors that should be looked at? Uh, the comment was made, the only CEQA document we have is the state programmatic EIR. And while that's true, the applicant can augment that. Uh, in fact, we require that for Type 3 licenses. Um, to look at uh, the impacts on, on the at the particularly local environment. When we look at variances, when we find one neighbor who objects, we find that it could be injurious to the parties, to the neighbor, and we deny the variance. At least that's our pattern. Um, I don't know that we've had one of these cases before where we're actually looking at, at this stage of a licensing issue. And so it's a somewhat new territory for us. And I do agree a lot with the last speaker's sentiment that the existing neighborhood that a, a, a cultivation is going to be in or is in is ignored by the process of licenses, license issuing that we have. And uh, so I am sympathetic to us taking those considerations into account. And um, it's unfortunate that it comes to a head now on one license application. But the system is sorely lacking in, in, in terms of looking at the context in which the license, any given license is issued. Um, I think we denied a variance off of Morgan Hill Road one time because of the density of the, of the housing in the area. Variances are different, I get that. But the notion of what is the impact on the neighbors is something that is extraordinarily relevant in the marijuana industry, the cultivation side of the marijuana industry. So um, this is not a slam dunk to me that, you know, the programmatic EIR, the boxes are checked and we're done. I don't see it that way. There were always going to be issues like this. And, you know, we've heard anecdotally that some people just give up and move away rather than con try to confront or deal with the situation that, in this case, you know, by the, by the book, it would be out of their control. I mean, the applicant, when seeking the license, has done everything our rules require of him. And that's, that's pretty commendable. I mean, in an ideal world, he would work with his neighbors, he'd put some sort of uh, odor control on his hoop houses, and he'd really work to minimize his impacts to his neighbors. You know, and maybe he'll do that, but that's something that's beyond our purview to require. So I, I guess I have a pretty hard time 
you know, upholding this appeal when the, the license applicant has done everything that we required. I agree that there are conflicts that happen out there, and those couldn't have been, you know, they're all site specific, wind direction, road issues, number of homes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of that stuff gets glossed over when you try to come up with something, a program. And we were sort of hoping that there wouldn't, with the number of permits that were going to be issued in the county, that we wouldn't have very many of these conflicts. Even though I think we all knew there were going to be conflicts. So. Is, is the ordinance ideal? Does it, does it protect neighborhoods? Yeah. Not completely, no. Not completely. Or at all. Some, some people might say not at all. But why is this the first one that we've heard then on these grounds? I mean, it's, it's interesting, like you mentioned, we have not had a complaint like this before. So either people have given up or their neighbors have tried to work with them to solve the issues as best they could, or, I don't know. Motion to uphold the approval of the commercial cannabis cultivation license, CCL number 671, as requested, used complies with the provisions established by Trinity County Commercial Cannabis Cultivation Ordinance, number 315, 843, which allows for limited cultivation within the rural residential zoning. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any competing motions or further discussion? Sure, I'll make a competing motion. I'll move that we approve the appeal. Uh, uphold the appeal of the uh, finding that the um, application of CEQA is inadequate in this case as it's been applied and the, um, either further CEQA work is done and comes back to the planning department or it's simply denied. We have a motion. I will second that motion for the purpose of discussion. And, uh, I would like to, I would like to find a way that we could protect neighborhoods that are opposed to and it's it's a slightly different here than some of the, a lot of the stuff we've ran into where it's an existing grow in an existing neighborhood and this is someone moving into a neighborhood to grow and we might not be hearing from the whole neighborhood, but definitely some opposition. And it would be in, it would be nice to be able to protect those neighborhoods. If uh, we don't, we've been through this before. If we had required a CUP for every license, we would be here forever, and never have any licenses. So, um, but there, there needs to be a way that we can deal with these. Um, contentious ones on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't, one night, it, it's tough to, to make a decision like this. I don't know the proper way to go about doing that. Yeah, well, it was um, probably four years ago now, when we were up at the um, 
at the library or at the uh, the high school cafeteria talking about the urgency ordinance and um, people within the community pled for a recognition of existing versus new farms and there was just no um, no intent, no ambition from the board to recognize a difference between existing impacts and new impacts. And so there, here we are, you know. There's existing farms that are possibly licensed, possibly not, as their neighbors, and then here's a new impact. And um, it really does need to be addressed. two already so um, we have two motions so starting with Commissioner McHugh's motion um, we will vote on that and all in favor of Commissioner McHugh's motion I want to um, thank him for um, working on the issue with the compound on Morgan Hill Road and I'm looking forward to um, hearing what happens tomorrow. Thank you. Issues um, was 
just our absolute limited capacity. I know you guys have heard this before, but to properly process applications. Um, Do you have, uh, have you hit 530 applications? Uh, that's kind of a trick question right now, Mike. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I, I'll explain why. I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, but yeah, we were, very, we were getting very close to the cap, and that was one, just the fear. We didn't know quite where we were. Um, and, um, and with our limited ability to process new applications, um, there's several that, um, this one that we just reviewed was one of the unique applications that was so clean, it, it was able to get through very, clean, very quickly. Um, the site was large enough to need a variance. There was a house. There was permitted septic, permitted well. It was a very clean file. Um, not many are like that, uh, unfortunately. But um, that's one of the few new licenses that have been issued. Most from February, January, February, March are still sitting in the drawer. We haven't even been able to touch them. Uh, I've directed my staff. The staff's been doing an amazing job. Everybody's taken on so much. But we were going to focus on the renewals on those licenses that were existing and that was the choice we had to make as far as priorities and we've held to that. Um, regarding the number, um, so um, you may be aware, you may not be aware, but um, when the ordinance was amended in February of 2019 at the board level, um, let's back up a little bit, when you reviewed that ordinance as planning commission, it is my understanding you reviewed that ordinance with some draft stacking language. Uh, it's also my understanding that when it got to the board level, there was advice given that while the EIR is underway, stacking should should probably be pulled out of that. Was advised that be pulled out of that that language, and not pursued until the EIR was completed, and we had a certified CEQA document for the cannabis program. When that language at the board level was removed, um, the language that had, had initially been there, the one license per parcel per person, was not replaced back into the ordinance. Uh, so therefore, there, um, there have been stacking licenses, stacking meaning multiple licenses on one parcel submitted to our office. Um, those are considered new applications as well. They are waiting to be processed. Um, just like the other non-stacking applications. However, um, one of the things on my list, um, my very long list to do, is to create a basic stacking policy to process these um, in the interim until we can amend the ordinance and get language back in, which of course has to wait till after the EIR. Um, so that is where we are. That's why I answered to Commissioner McHugh um, it's kind of a trick question right now um, because, um, yeah, we are very close to the 530, and uh, yeah. I I appreciate knowing um, what happened because I had heard that people were applying for stacking licenses, and I was wondering how. So now I know. Another reason we stopped taking the applications. Yeah. So how was it that 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 got through and not put back in? I'm not sure I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. here. That's, yeah. So with regards to the stacking, is it such where is it with regards to one property and you can have multiple Multi multiple licenses. licenses on one property? Right. And then so um, basically we've interpreted the code for two different types of stacking, vertical and horizontal. Um, so the horizontal is when you own contiguous parcels and you have a house in one parcel, you can have licenses on those multiple parcels and you don't need the residence on. So you have basically yeah, the horizontal stacking, the vertical stacking. Uh, and these are just terms we, we use staff-wise just to kind of understand which stacking we're talking about. And then there's the horizontal stacking, and that is the multiple licenses on one parcel. I ask because there's a, um, a constituent downriver in Junction City. Mm -hmm. They have a neighbor that has one house. And this is just as of this year, and they have four licenses. Right. Um, in a rural residential neighborhood. Right. Um, without yeah. any 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 um, more oversight than one license. And is it one applicant with four licenses? Uh, if they have four parcels, 
and they're contiguous under the same ownership, that is the example of horizontal stacking. And so how is that allowed um, where it's screwed up? It's, so it's not, not the allowed. The concept of no. a legal parcel is introduced in the beginning where yes. contiguous parcels, and we debated whether it could be within a quarter mile, but I think it ended up contiguous parcels mm -hmm. under the same ownership, one of which had a residence, and it was with one legal parcel. And so you, the idea then was you would have a parcel with your house on it and the parcel next door is where you put the grow because the two were considered one legal parcel for this purpose. But why were they about that stacking at this when point? When this... Uh, that's not right. That's, that's not when, So, excuse me. When this that's ordinance, not considered stacking. That, no, she said that's no, you got horizontal multiple, stacking. There's multiple grows. On the, on there's the four time. licenses, four grows, one house. Four properties, all owned by the same place. So I have yeah. time to answer the question. The screw up in February of, or was it February or January of last year, was that when stacking was considered here as a way to do this legitimately, we sent something up to the board where there would be a lot. They decided not to do it because of the uh, EIR in flight. And when they made the change to take what we put in back out, they neglected to put back in the limitation that allowed stacking in the first place. And so they passed an ordinance that had removed stacking. So now that's what's on the books. Now you still have the notion of a legal parcel. You can have four parcels, all with contiguous parcels all with the same ownership. That's one parcel, a legal parcel. But with this screw up in the ordinance, you can go get multiple licenses. So it's a great opportunity for some people. And it's looking on the radar until some people figure it out. To the detriment of neighbors. I, I have a, another question. With the EIR, when it comes back to us, will we be meeting here or in a larger facility? Yeah. Um, in a larger facility. Okay, thank you. Just making sure. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you about the calendar? Go ahead, sir. What's the next meeting? September 10th. Okay, thank you. September 10th. It came off, it sounds like you said December. <laughs> yeah, be too much of <laughs> Okay, with that, we are adjourned. Especially after this meeting. December 10th. Yes, that's interesting. Give me some of the